Time 5 3 arrived. I'd like to call the Tuesday, April 10th, 2018, Committee of the Whole Meeting to order. Uh, would you stand, please, join me in the pledge? Mm -hmm. Pledge like your allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Clerk, would you please take the roll? I will. Alderman Redpath. Alderman Senor. Here. Alderman Turner. Here. Alderman Fulgenzi. Here. Alderman Proctor. Here. Alderman DeCenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderman Tylen. Alderman Donnellan. Here. Alderman Hanauer. Here. Mr. Chairman, a quorum is present. All right. We have to take a vote to allow. Okay. Uh, accept the motion to allow Alderman McMiniman to participate by uh, phone. So moved. Second. Second. All, right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Seeing none. Welcome to the meeting, Alderman McMiniman. Uh, all right. I'd like to accept a motion for approval of the March 27, 2018 committee meeting minutes. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Accepted. Uh, Madam Treasurer, will you please present the Treasurer's report? Thank you, Chair Proctor. The corporate fund in the month of March had a beginning balance of $1,800,960. We took in total receipts of $8,811,342. We had total disbursements in the month of March of $7,123,759, which left the corporate fund with an ending balance of $3,488,543. This concludes my report. Thank you, Chair Proctor. Okay. Any questions for the treasurer? Seeing none, thank you much for that report. Uh, are there any questions regarding the uh, OBM contract report? Seeing none, all right, moving on. Uh, we do have two presentations, looks like. Uh, we'll have uh, Judge Holmes uh, present his uh, quarterly update uh, regarding the Office of Inspector General. Judge Holmes. All right, thank you, Chairman Proctor, Mr. Mayor, Alderman, Corporation Council. Uh, in looking at what I passed out, I do want to make one correction. Uh, all of these say update to 2017 OIG in a number. Uh, I added the word update to one of them and it appears in all of them, so I'll tell you which one is the updated one. Otherwise, these are all new reports. Uh, I have six reports, so uh, you have them before you and I'll summarize them briefly. The first two being the longest matters. Uh, 2017 OIG 13, uh, Hillard Hines was the former Inspector General for Springfield. After their contract ended, they continued to log in calls. They didn't act upon them, but they logged them in. And when I came on as, as consultant to the mayor on Inspector General matters before being appointed, uh, I was given that call log uh, and there was a matter logged in under three case numbers on April 15th of 15, uh, and it was described as uh, an anonymous caller called in 
issues of equipment purchases, employee doing personal work on city time, and hiring practices at CWLP. And I mention those because I'm going to circle back to that at the end. Um, I uh, found a phone number attached with the anonymous call. I called it in January of 16. The person who answered had a lot of questions so that she could authenticate who I was. Uh, indicated she had no interest in moving forward on the matters and did not provide a name. I gave her my phone number and email and uh, thereafter I didn't hear until the end of February of 2016. I received an email and met with the complainant face to face. Uh, she related issues of hostile work environment stating that as a female employee her supervisor invited her into his private office, pulled her toward him, kissed her and attempted to insert his tongue into her mouth. Uh, she felt that she was dis uh, retaliated after rejecting these advances and uh, throughout she was reading to me from some sort of log or diary. I asked her for a copy. Uh, and she said she would do that. On March 14th of 16, she left a message that she would drop off the journal. That never occurred, and 18 months elapsed before I heard from her again. Uh, in October of 17, the Executive Secretary of uh, the City Council Coordinator's Office received an anonymous voicemail. Uh, which she forwarded to me and we recognized that to be the complainant's voice. Uh, I heard nothing uh, then until uh, about a month after that uh, when we had another face-to-face -face meeting. At this meeting, as before, she promised to provide me with names of other people who would come forward uh, and support her allegations and perhaps we're also victims of the same actions. That has never occurred. Uh, the complainant did provide me at that time with a copy of a document called Grievance Resolution from September of 15, uh, and I've attached a redacted copy of that to the report. Essentially, uh, in exchange to, uh, for the complainant agreeing to waive any legal claim against the city, uh, she was reassigned until her irrevocable retirement date. Uh, and at that, uh, that document was executed by Stephanie Barton for the city and a union representative along with the complainant. Uh, it was at that point that I realized if I were to make a finding that there was a probable cause that the incident occurred, I would refer it to HR for uh, appropriate action. So knowing that there had been some uh, grievance issues before, I contacted HR to see if they had previously uh, uh, reprimanded or in, taken any action against the uh, respondent. Uh, and I was provided with a very lengthy and thorough confidential report about the incident. Uh, investigation was conducted under the direction of uh, then Human Resources Director Melina Tamaras Collins. Also participating were Molly Smith and Jim Cousin. Uh, they uh, interviewed the complainant. She also talked uh, while looking at her log. Uh, and ask that a number of people have be interviewed. HR conducted a total of 10 interviews, uh, not counting uh, the complainant and respondent, and significantly four of those persons interviewed were female employees, uh, none of whom had any complaints against respondent, uh, none of whom claimed to have heard about complaints other than one who said she'd heard claimant's accusations. Uh, a number of coworkers were interviewed, and uh, at the conclusion of HR's report, they stated, upon thorough, objective, and thoughtful review of the complaint, along with the statements made by all involved parties, there is insufficient evidence to support allegations of harassment, hostile work environment, or discrimination. Uh, I felt it was my duty to it, uh, since I had spoken with the complainant, to speak with the uh, respondent in the company of Jim Cousin. Uh, a lengthy face-to-face -face interview. Uh, the respondent flatly denied allegations, said that when he became supervisor, complainant was also a candidate for that job. Uh, and the first uh, thing that she did was come to his office with a list of 
how he should run the department. Uh, also significant, uh, it wasn't until later that respondent claims to have heard of the date of the alleged incident, but uh, he testified that there had been a number of uh, meetings in his private office with the complainant coming to his office uh, after the date of the alleged incident. Uh, so there is a passage of approximately four years here. It has been interviewed at length. It's of some significance to note that three of HR's people who conducted the interviews uh, were female and who participated in the process. Um, I have come to the same conclusion. No uh, corroborating witnesses were brought forth uh, with the passage of time uh, and the uh, very thorough interviews that I read that HR did, I have uh, concluded uh, that while all allegations of unwanted physical or sexual contact warrant a very thorough investigation, this matter has been sufficiently investigated on multiple occasions over the last four years, and the Inspector General's investigation is closed without further action. So that's the first of two longer ones. Uh, Two thousand and seventeen OIG twelve uh, was also uh, the subject of uh, Hillard Heinz log, uh, and it's someone who I contacted in January of two thousand and sixteen uh, in response to complaints that he logged in with Hillard Heinz that the city was not filing federal employment guidelines relating to African Americans and other minorities. I contacted him in January sixteen and he did not wish to pursue the matters further with me. Uh, I did hear from him again in late 2017, and while complainants' names are kept anonymous, uh, Larry Beckham, the complainant, declined to be referred to anonymously and uh, consented to being named in the report. Uh, he raises primarily the issue that CWOP's Water Purification Treatment Division, which is the people that ensure the quality of the water that's going into the system uh, consists of 14 employees with no African-American employees. Uh, Mr. Beckham has studied to become a water treatment operator, represents that he holds a uh, EPA water treatment operator license, and he previously unsuccessfully applied for the position and interviewed with former City Human Resources Director Melina Tamaras Collins uh, he also claims that current water treatment workers are not fully licensed. Uh, in the course of my investigation, I interviewed Ted Meckes, CWLP's water division manager. Uh, we spoke at length, and he represented that each of the 14 employees currently holds a Class A uh, EPA uh, license, even though uh, the EPA does not require that every water operator have a Class A license. Of the 14 current workers, one is a minority of Pacific, Pacific Island descent. The other 13 are Caucasian males. All are members of the Operating Engineers 399-7. Uh, the significant issue is there is very little turnover in the department. Five of the 14 currently working there were hired in the 1980s and 90s, and the last hire in this division occurred four years ago. So no one has been, there has not been an opening, there has not been a hire in four years. Uh, Mr. Beckham also indicated that uh, there were limited African Americans in history in that position. I was provided a list with three prior African American workers, one who worked from June 1980 until retirement in 2003, another from 2009 until transferred to a different position in 2014, and another who worked from December 2003 until leaving the city in 2010. So it is problematic to look at a department and see that, that uh, there is only one minority higher. I have found no indication, however, that the underutilization of minorities was intentional, uh, but is more closely related to the licensing requirement and, most significantly, to the uh, low turnover, with no job being offered for four years. Uh, 
due to the small size of the sample size of the water treatment department, I looked at other departments under Mr. Mekas's uh, control. He oversees the water distribution department, which has 46 employees, seven of whom are African American and three of whom are female. He also oversees the water resources department with four employees, of whom one is African American, two are male, and two are female. Looking at CWP on a much broader scale, as of the fourth quarter of 2017, CWP had 556 employees, of which 11.5% roughly were minorities. Uh, and it, I think that looking at this much larger statistical sample gives us a better picture of hiring practices. Uh, the remainder of my port, report goes on to review the affirmative action plan that's in place, various sections of the city code which prohibit discrimination uh, on a number of uh, bases. And uh, it's my recommendation uh, that even though there is low turnover, at some point there's going to be turnover. And just a reminder that as in all, as in all city hiring, hiring process must strictly comply with the aforementioned affirmative action and equal opportunity requirements. Uh, I would also recommend that upon an opening uh, coming into existence, that the water treatment department aggressively search for minority applicants at SIU Edwardsville, which offers a water treatment education program and degree. Uh, and also, I would suggest that CWP look into uh, an internship program in conjunction with SIUE, seeking and nurturing aspiring minority applicants. All right, turning to 2017, uh, OIG 15. Uh, is a uh, was contacted by a complainant regarding an incident with a city employee. The complainant initially contacted an alderman to question whether a city employee was operating a business which conflicted with employees' duties to the city and whether or not that business was conducted on city time. Uh, the alderman contacted uh, the appropriate uh, people uh, who supervised the employee in question and reported back that there was no in indication that the employee uh, uh, engaged in the side business on city time and the city was aware that this business was being conducted. The difficulty is that three days after complainant's initial contact, uh, the city employee filed a verified petition for stalking no contact order with the Circuit Court of Sangamon County against the citizen complainant. Uh, as grounds for seeking the no contact order, the employee stated uh, 18 October 17, complainant emailed an alderman that forwarded the email up to employee supervisor accusing me of performing my home inspection duties while I was on the job with the city. So the sole basis for seeking the anti-stalking order was that an inquiry by a citizen had been made. Uh, these. Uh, I can tell you from personal experience, the first hearing of these petitions is done with only the petitioner present, having signed the petition under oath. The person who is the alleged stalker or uh, abuser is not present at that time. Emergency order can be uh, entered for a short time. In this case, there was a full hearing on the merits 20 days later. Um, Court conducted a full hearing with the employee present, the complainant present in person, and by a privately retained attorney. After the hearing, the judge said that the emergency order and the petition were dismissed on the basis of insufficient evidence, and complainant relates spending $1,800 to retain an attorney for that hearing. Uh, under repeated questioning by me, complainant steadfastly maintained there was no prior relationship with the employee other than having met the city employee socially. Uh, if there had been any type of family marital dating relationship, this would have been filed as an order of protection rather than an anti-stalking order. So I be would believe that would rule out any such claim. Uh, so based on uh, the specific wording of the petition, it's my opinion that the employee was acting in retaliation. Uh, the city has a, c a civil service rule which states that an employee can be disciplined for offensive or profane conduct in the treatment of fellow employees or the public. So as a result of my investigation, I have turned the matter over to uh, Jim Cousin, Human Resources Director, for
before appropriate disciplinary action is deemed appropriate by the department. All right, uh, 2017 OIG 15, this one is the updated report. So uh, last December I reported to you about Axon video and audio recording in the detective interview rooms that was found to be on a 24-7 basis uh, and a full report was made to you. Uh, I have followed up on that. Uh, Chief Winslow provided, uh, after surveying the detectives involved, a list of five possible criminal defense attorneys who may have unwittingly been recorded uh, and therefore I uh, December 20th, wrote a letter to each of the five defense attorneys with a synopsis of the situation and attached a, uh, to each letter a full report, the same one I gave to you the, at the council meeting. Uh, and I sent a similar letter to State's Attorney John Milheiser along with the full report. In each letter I offered uh, to field any questions, have not received any response from any of the six recipients as of this writing. Uh, finally, uh, further update. Uh, at the time of my last report, the city was promised that in a couple of weeks there would be a computer program fix to stop the video recording. Uh, this finally was provided by the vendor Axon and put in service on March 26th of 2018, so the 24-7 video and audio recording has ended uh, at the present time. Uh, the person using the system has to affirmatively turn it on and affirmatively turn it off. And Axon has reminded SPD that if an investigator does not initiate recording in the proper manner, there is no longer any backup of audio or video. All right, uh, 2018 OIG1. Uh, this investigation was commenced at the request of an alderman who had been contacted by a constituent regarding an incident wherein a female city employee complained of unwanted contact consisting of a hug and a kiss on the back of the neck by a male uh, co-employee. Uh, I was asked to review uh, human resources response to the allegations. Uh, I have had no contact with the aggrieved uh, party personally. I did, however, immediately contact Jim Cousin, uh, who demonstrated that he was well aware of the incident and his investigation was fully underway but not completed. Uh, Mr. Cousin and I agreed uh, that it would be confusing to conduct two simultaneously, uh, two simultaneous interviews, so I agreed to stand down and he promised uh, that I would get uh, a full report when he was finished and he was true to his word and timely provided me with that report, uh, which was completed by Human Resources Investigator Stephanie Barton. Uh, I also was given the opportunity to review uh, several segments of uh, surveillance videos uh, that were made contemporaneous with the alleged incident. Uh, first, it's my opinion that Ms. Barton, under the direction of Human Resources, conduct a thorough, dignified, and compassionate investigation into the incident. Uh, Ms. Barton investigated uh, and conducted multiple interviews with parties and other co-workers. Uh, it was determined that at a minimum there was contact between the male employee and the female's arm. Uh, he indicated that he was energetically greeting her to share his happiness at resolving a medical issue. Uh, the male employee denied kissing the female on the back of the neck but said he may have made a kissing sound. Uh, I reviewed the uh, surveillance video and it does show uh, that uh, the male uh, grasped the arm of the female. Uh, due to the camera angle, it neither confirmed nor, nor denied if a kiss occurred. Uh, the female employee states that she's 100% certain that that did occur. Uh, prior to uh, this incident, the two had worked together uh, since the female employee began working as a probationary employee in July of 17. Uh, later on that same day, uh, in the video, you can see the female being touched, but she does not react and continues doing her job. But later in the day, she did contact her supervisor making a claim of sexual assault, uh, which the city defines as an act that violates 
uh, the Illinois Criminal Code, uh, but that act requires an act of sexual penetration, which is certainly not the incident occurred here. Um, while it does not rise to the level of sexual assault, uh, Ms. Barton appropriately found that the male employee violated the city's non-discrimination and harassment policy by making uh, unwelcome hugging or kissing physical contact, violated city code by failure to follow department work rules and civil service commission rules committing offensive or profane conduct in the treatment of a fellow employee. Uh, following these findings, uh, HR uh, suspended the uh, respondent employee for uh, one day for his conduct. Mr. Cousin relates that the female employee is satisfied with the outcome uh, and I will take no further action in the case. And told you they would get quicker as we went along. Uh, 2018 OIG 2 uh, complainant contacted me in my role as inspector general. I interviewed the complainant at length and began to investigate uh, the matter brought to my attention. Uh, shortly after that, complainant contacted me and withdrew his complaint, and this matter is closed with no action having uh, been taken. So that concludes my first quarter 2018 report. All right, thank you for your report. Uh, are there any questions? Busy little bugger, what? I'm sorry? You're a busy little bugger, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's more that I'll report on in the next quarter. <laughs> all right, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Judge. All right, uh, next up we have Hanson. I think Jamal wants to do a presentation on the high speed rail. Uh, Jim Mall with Hanson Professional Services, 1525 South 6th Street in Springfield. I thought it would be a good idea to get back with the City Council on a regular basis and keep you updated on the progress of the Springfield Rail Improvements Project. But I'd like to start off with just a few things that kind of give us all pause and remind us of the importance of this project. On February 14th of last year, a 54-year-old man was hit and killed by a train at 10th and Ash Street here in Springfield. On June the 7th of last year, a citizen was hit in, by a train at 3rd and Laurel and critically injured. On September 9th of last year, on the northeast side of town, a 55-year-old Springfield citizen was hit by a train and killed. On September 13th last year at 3rd and Laurel, a 35-year-old Springfield resident was hit by a train and killed. I don't think there's anything that could explain the importance of this project better than that information there. All of these incidences would be addressed by this project. I think everybody's got the yellow sheet, which kind of shows you what we have out there today, just as a reminder, everybody, this is the cons cons the existing conditions of the rail corridors in Springfield, three north-south corridors at 3rd, 10th, and 19th Street. 68 dangerous at-grade crossings spread throughout the city more per capita than any other city in the state of Illinois. The blue sheet on the other side of that shows what the proposal is, and that is to move those 3rd Street trains, the Amtrak trains and Union Pacific trains, over onto a new corridor on 10th Street a widened corridor with grade separations, overpasses and underpasses at all the busy streets in the corridor. And in addition to that, to construct new underpasses in the 19th Street corridor at South Grand and Ash Street and thereby grade separate all the busy streets on the 19th Street corridor. And then they create a quiet zone that would encompass the entire city. The benefits of this would be to shift all the rail traffic from 3rd to 10th Street, get the rail traffic out of the medical district and out of downtown, build nine new underpasses and overpasses throughout the city. And by doing this, we will reduce car train accidents, the chances of, hit, of a car getting hit by a train by 80%, and we'll reduce the vehicle delays, people waiting for trains in the city by 70%, and eliminate the train horn noise throughout the city by creating a quiet zone. We'd also fence the new rail corridor to reduce the problems that we currently have with trespassing, people being on the tracks when they shouldn't be. The pro total project cost is about $315 million based on our estimate that we did back in 2010. So what have we got done today? So far we've got our environmental impact statement completed and approved with a record of decision by the Federal Railroad Administration back in 2012. 
Then we began construction on the Carpenter Street underpass, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, and we finished that up in 2016. So we were able to build that first usable segment, and by having that Carpenter Street underpass, people who live east of 11th Street don't have to worry about getting stopped by a train if they need to get to St. John's or Memorial Hospitals. They can always go to the new underpass of Carpenter Street. We also built a little improvement up at Ridgely Avenue up to the north end of town to get that ready for when we relocate the tracks. We've also got started uh, just this last year on the next segment, which is usable segment two, which is the stretch from South Grand Avenue down to just about 6th Street, and it includes the new underpass at Ash Street and a new underpass at Laurel Street. And both these new underpasses will look a lot like Carpenter Street, with the elevated sidewalks on either side, widened outside lanes to accommodate bicyclists, and in order to handle the flooding, uh, pump stations at each underpass, along with about 70,000 gallons of storage for the stormwater that comes in. In order to construct that piece, that usable segment that's under construction now, we had to acquire about 50 parcels. Uh, properties, separate properties of land necessary to build this. Uh, we were able to acquire all 50 of those parcels without taking any properties to condemnation. We had a little trouble with a cell tower property, but we got through that, and the bids were opened in 2017. The bids came in well under the budget for the project, and as I said, we are under construction. The uh, total co project cost for that South Grand to Princeton piece, our usable segment two, is $44.3 million, and that was funded with about a million and a half dollars of city funds, $11.8 million of IDOT funds, $15 million from the ICC, the Illinois Commerce Commission, as part of their Grade Crossing Protection Fund, and $16 million in federal funds through a Tiger Grant. Looking right above that, the Carpenter Street project, you can see that was a $17.3 million project that we accomplished with no city funds, thanks to a Tiger Grant and funds from the ICC. So between those two projects, the city's cost share so far has only been $1.5 million, a pretty amazing figure of what we've been able to accomplish with such a small amount of city funding. It's not gonna to continue to be that good as we go forward, but that's a pretty nice piece to have done for the very little amount of city money. As I said, we're working on construction out there at Ash Street. The first thing we had to do is relocate a 72-inch diameter storm sewer, which crosses right where the new underpass is. And in order to do that, we had to push an eight-foot diameter steel pipe underneath the railroad tracks. We literally pushed the pipe through, and then they dug the dirt out inside of the pipe in order to open it up so that we would have then a tunnel underneath the railroad tracks that then we could push the new sewer pipe through. And that's how we got the sewer pipe realigned to get it across and get it out from under where the new underpass is going to be. And also at the same time, we had to pump the sewage around that site because we couldn't have the sewage flowing through the pipe while we're working on it. So we had to set up pits, erect to set up a bunch of pumps, connect pipes down into the sewer and literally suck the sewage out of the sewer while it's operating, pump it to another manhole further downstream in order to keep the section clean while we worked out that piece. The construction out there is continuing. We anticipate that we'll be working on bridge abutments like the one you see here that's already constructed. We're gonna be working on the rest of those, setting steel beams and then starting to do the excavation work out with the goal of having Ash Street completed and open back to traffic as an underpass in the spring of 2019. As soon as we're done with that, we're gonna move up to Laurel Street, close Laurel, repeat the process, with the goal of having Laurel Street also completed by the fall of 2020. So over the next two and a half years, we're gonna see a steady stream of construction at Ash Street and Laurel Streets. The next piece of the project that we plan to construct is usable segment four which is this piece south of the one that's under construction now, which will take us from 6th Street all the way down to Stanford Avenue. The, we have begun land acquisition for that piece. There are about 40-some parcels to be acquired. We've settled on 26 of those. We have 15 that are still in negotiations. Our goal is to get all of those acquired without having to go to condemnation on any of those. And it looks like the total land acquisition cost, including the relocation cost for the property owners down there, is going to be about $2.5 million. And as part of the city's agreement with the Illinois Department of Transportation, the city is handling those land, uh, relocation and land acquisition costs. We're very far along on the design of this piece. We hope to have design plans completed next month. 
And once funding becomes available, we could begin construction on this project later this year. We have a funding plan I'll talk about in a little bit. But once the funding becomes available, we'll be ready to go right into construction on this piece. And once this piece is done, this usable segment four, the entire project will be completed from South Grand Avenue all the way out down to Stanford, other than laying some additional track once it's time to move the Union Pacific Railroad over. So we think we're in a very good position to have the entire piece of the project south of South Grand Avenue completed in the near future. We're in a good place as far as funding is concerned. The next piece that we would plan to build is usable segment three, which is the Madison and Jefferson Street underpasses. A very important project because of the amount of traffic that both those streets carry and the number of trains per day that are on that 10th Street corridor causes a lot of delays and a lot of risk of accidents. So it would be nice to get the Madison and Jefferson Street underpasses completed. That will be the next piece after the usable segment four. <coughs> Uh, back to funding, as I said, on the usable segment four project, which is the next one we want to build, we're looking at about $3 million worth of city money. That includes that land acquisition I talked about. Uh, IDOT has committed, once there is a capital bill, $70.8 million in total funds to this project after a capital bill is passed. We'd use about $19 million of that for the usable segment four project. We plan to apply for a future Tiger grant which we have got, we've gotten Tiger Grants in the past for Carpenter Street and for usable segment two. We would hope to get another Tiger Grant from the federal government of $22 million. That's how we propose to pay for this $44 million project. Those of you who are not aware, the federal government recently passed a new infrastructure program which tripled the amount of money that's going into the Tiger Fund. So we think that we have a very good chance of securing a future grant for that piece of the project. We think we've got that funding lined up. We hope that once there's a capital bill, we can put that package together. The next piece after that would be the Madison and Jefferson underpasses. Again, the city would be responsible for land acquisition and uh, city water, light, and power's utility relocations. We estimate that at about 4.6 million, 4.9 million from IDOT. We think that this project will be very attractive to the Illinois Commerce Commission and their Grade Crossing Protection Fund. So we would hope to get $14 million from them, and then hopefully another $23 million from the federal government for that project. And then the Jefferson Street to South Grand, the middle piece, again, with $4.5 million of city funds, the remainder of the IDOT funds that's already committed to the project, hopefully another federal grant, we think that we can fund that project too. So we think from a funding standpoint, once there is a state capital bill, and assuming that our congressional delegation who has been so helpful to us all the way through this project continues to put the project forward in Washington, we think we have a very good chance to fund this project and keep it moving through 2022 with all these pieces. And as you can see, even once all of those other sections are built, the city's share of the funding, the city's share of that $210 million is only about 6%. So from the city standpoint, that's a lot of money coming into the community for construction jobs and to complete a very valuable project, primarily from other state and federal sources. The other piece of the project that we have begun to work on is the multimodal facility just north of where the county building is on those two blocks on either side of the tracks is the proposed location of the multimodal facility. That is already where SMTD plans to relocate their bus transfer facility, and that multimodal facility would include the bus transfer, the new Amtrak station, and probably where the Greyhound buses would be located, probably an airport shuttle, and whatever else the community decides needs to be included in that. The county has recently secured a $400,000 grant from the Illinois Department of Transportation to begin the study work, not just for that site, but for the area around that site in an evaluation of what other transportation-related development might be able to occur, occur once that site becomes our new transportation hub in the community. So we will continue to work on that project, pushing forward on the design of that. Because our goal, and we think it's an achievable goal as soon as the funding comes through, is by 2025, be ready to move the trains off of the 3rd Street corridor over onto the 10th Street corridor and accomplish the first major piece of a project that I know has been talked about in Springfield since at least the 1920s. So a major step forward, which we can actually now see as a possibility of actually occurring by 2025. 
I want to make sure that you're all aware that we have continued our public engagement program that we started at the very beginning of this project. We have not slacked off in that in the slightest. We have public meetings every six months, and we have at least, I think, five or 6,000 people on our note meeting notification list that we let know about those meetings so that everybody has a chance any, every, every one of those meetings every six months come in and talk about the project, how it might affect them, get their questions answered, and get an update. In addition to that, we are always available to go out to talk to people, to make presentations, to explain the project, to meet with property owners or answer any questions. In addition to that, we have a focus group, group that meets every six months of interested people that just that work on specific problems and get questions answered and get project updates. So every three months, we're out talking to the, out to the public on a regular basis, and we make numerous presentations in between. So we're trying to make sure we stay ahead of this public engagement program so that everybody's aware of what's going on on the project at all times. I missed this slide. That shows where the, where the uh, multimodal facility is. Uh, it, it will extend from 9th Street over to 11th Street with some sort of a bridge connecting between the two, probably parking on one side, uh, multimodal, Amtrak, bus, bus transfer on the other side. A lot of planning still needs to go into that. The other thing I wanted to update everybody on is the status of the archaeology site we found when we were building the Carpenter Street underpass. I'm sure everybody's familiar with this. In the process of doing the earthwork for the Carpenter Street project, we, our project archaeologists went out there because we had suspicions that there might be some uh, interesting stuff out there. And what they found was foundations from a number of houses that were built in the 19, or were burned in the 1908 race riot, the race riot that led to the formation of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. This site and the, what was found there in terms of artifacts and also house foundations was determined significant enough that it was placed on as eligible for <laughs> placement on the National Register of Historic Places, which kicked in a lot of federal regulations that we had to go through in order to proceed with the project. And the first thing we had to do was to demonstrate to the Federal Railroad Administration that there weren't any feasible and prudent alternatives to totally avoid the site. We had met with what we call our consulting parties, interest parties who were specifically interested in this site early on back in 2015. And at that time, they determined that we should avoid whatever parts of the site we could, but where we didn't, weren't able to avoid the site, we should go ahead and excavate and recover artifacts. That wasn't enough for the FRA. They insisted on very detailed, long and detailed studies of what it would take to totally avoid that site. We spent three years in discussions, negotiations, and analysis with them. And finally, earlier this year, they determined that, in fact, there are no feasible and prudent alternatives that would totally avoid the site. So then they asked us to look at alternatives that would minimize impacts to the site. And we went through a deep study process and determined that we could shift the whole corridor over about 20, 25 feet in the vicinity of these house foundations, totally avoiding house foundation A, which everybody had felt all along was the most important artifact out there, and really avoid most of house B, C, D, and about half of house E. We made that presentation to the FRA, and then Mid last month, we made that presentation to the consulting parties, which included the uh, St. John's Hospital, who's obviously a, an interested party here, the NAACP, the Faith Coalition, the uh, African American History Museum. About 20, 25 people were involved in this, and that group voted 22 to 1 to proceed with this alternative M2, this avoidance alternative. So based on that, we now have established what we're going to do in terms of the rail corridor at the vicinity of these house foundations. And the NAACP has volunteered to lead a smaller group, which would then look at what we should do to mitigate for the impacts, both in terms of excavating and, and uh, uh, preserving the artifacts and also memorializing the site. And they are currently working on that, plan to come back to the overall consulting parties group in another month or so and make a presentation on what they felt would be the uh, minimization alternatives. St. John's Hospital is also working with the NAACP along with the city to determine what those mitigation options might be. So that process has taken a major leap forward just over the last couple of months, and now we think we have a clear line of sight to move the project forward in this area. 
Um, all of this, of course, comes with the support and actions of the City Council, and I think on tonight's discussion there is an amendment to an agreement between the City and the Illinois Department of Transportation regarding funding for the usable segment 2 project. What that essentially is, is the bids for that project came in low, came in under budget, so we were able to reduce some parts. We were able to shift some money around and simplify the billing and funding process. That's essentially what that agreement is tonight to be discussed. In addition, you will probably continue to see property purchase agreements for the usable segment four part, the part south of uh, 6th Street down to Stanford Avenue. There have been a number of those in front of the city council already. You'll probably continue to see those over the next few months. Other things that you're going to be seeing will be an amendment to Hansen, Hansen's agreement because now there is the funding available to allow us to proceed with the design of usable segment four and usable segment three. So there will be an amendment to our agreement. All of that money is being funded through the grants from the federal government, from the ICC and IDOT. There's no city money involved in our design work. And also there will be another amendment to Hansen's contract that allows us to proceed with recovery of artifacts out at this archaeology site and to proceed with the analysis for an approval process through the FRA. That fund is coming from the Tiger Grant that was approved by the federal government for the Carpenter Street project. So again, that supplement to our agreement will be funded not by the city but by the federal government through the Tiger Grant. And I covered a whole lot in a very short amount of time, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, Alderman Sinar. Yeah, um, first of all, I'd like to compliment uh, Hansons and the rest of the parties involved on their work in this. I know it's been a, a arduous task, to say the least, but uh, and there's a lot of moving parts in this. But could you go back over, uh, I know it's not coming up quickly, but on the Jefferson and Madison Street, when it gets to that point, how are you going to proceed with those two underpasses? Well, once we get to that point, there, we obviously will have some land acquisition issues to deal with there. The city has already made a major step on that with regard to the... Uh, the Salvation Army property, but we will need to continue the land acquisition there. But I think once it comes time to build Madison and Jefferson streets, we have not been able to come up with a way to keep other, either one of those streets open during construction. So our plan currently, once we get the funding in place for that, our plan would be to close each one of those streets individually and detour traffic but set the schedule such that we would absolutely minimize the amount of time that those streets were, were closed, probably by prefabricating portions of the structure and putting them in place so that we would minimize the amount of time the streets are closed. We think the funding for that will be a combination of city funding for, for uh, land acquisition and then state and federal funding. And then when you do the underpasses on 5th and 6th Street, how, how are you going to proceed with those? Are they going to be full line closures? Or? No, 5th and 6th Street are a lot easier because we don't have to dig the road out. The road's already dug out. So all we have to do is replace the structures up above. So what we think we're going to do there is do that in temporary overnight closures where we would just close the roadway overnight or over a weekend just long enough to take the old bridges out and set a new bridge in place. We can't shut the railroad down, so we will probably condense this time schedule for those two underpasses into an overnight or weekend closure of those streets with a deep mark detour. And again, my compliments to all parties involved in this. I appreciate your efforts. Sure, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Alderwoman DeCinzo. Uh, thank you, and thank you also to Hanson for being so available. Um, I talked to Jimmy Austin almost on a daily basis lately. That's good. Uh, in regards to usable segment four, I have a few constituents who have been offered partial buyouts of their property. So 40 percent, 20 percent, and a few of them have an issue with this, of course. They're, us they're losing their backyard or they're us losing their driveway, um, and I have an issue with it too. You know, people buy these houses, and, and, and Hanson's response was, well, they knew they were buying close to the railroad tracks, so, you know, that's just kind of how it is. And that just doesn't sit very well with me. Um, you know, these are people's homes, and they have their children there, and for someone to come in, if someone came to me and said, we're, we're offering you 40%, to, we're going to buy 40% of your, your property, and that's all you get. Well, I, I think this is one of the reasons that the city felt most comfortable 
doing the land acquisition for this project as opposed to turning it over to the Illinois Department of Transportation as their part. Because the city was going to have to put something in the project. It made sense for the city to do the land acquisition. Because this city council has the flexibility to deal with issues like that. We only need a corner of the backyard. We only need a, a clip off the corner of their backyard. There is no justification to take the entire property just to clip a corner of, off the backyard. From an engineering and land acquisition standpoint, there is no justification for that. But I can easily see where there might be a public engagement and a public concern reason to purchase that entire property. And that would be a decision that this city council would need to make. That certainly isn't a decision that we can make. So we can tell you how much we need. We can tell you how much that we think that should cost. But if, this, if this, this council believes that we should go ahead and purchase that entire piece of property, that's, that's really your decision and we'd be more than happy to do that. It simplifies our process, I can tell you that. Jim, because if it was, if, if land acquisition was under the federal jurisdiction, I'll say, then- That'd be it. That would be it. That'd be it. Mm -hmm. Yep. So how does a process like that work if Alderman DeCinzo has property owners who would like all their property to be purchased. Should they go through her or should they go through you or the city or how should they make that known? Well, the property owners let us know and we let the public work staff know that this is what this property owner has asked for. It's very difficult for the public work staff to make a decision to purchase an entire property when we only need a corner because there's going to be all sorts of other properties all through the city where we're just going to need corners. Now, does the public works staff decide that, well, every time we need even a little bit of somebody's property, do we take their whole property? That, that gets beyond an engineering decision and becomes a policy decision that I don't feel that we should make. Uh, Alderman Fulgenzi. Yes, uh, I know you talked to me about it uh, a little while ago, but just to get it on record, uh, the North Rand segments, the 10th Street corridor, uh, you mentioned that the 3rd Street tracks would be moved by 2025. Does that mean that the overpass or the underpass at uh, 10th and North Grand would be built by then? Yes, in order to move the trains off of 3rd Street over to 10th Street, we'd have to build that new underpass on North Grand Avenue between 9th and 11th. Now the overpass that we plan further to the east, just east of where the ballpark is, that would not need to be constructed in order to move the trains. But the underpass, right where the EPA building is now, that underpass would needs to be constructed before we can move the trains off a third onto 10th. But the overpass uh, by the ballpark, that would, be need to, that would need to be constructed for safety reasons? Well, eventually, I think we need to construct that overpass primarily for safety reasons, for the delays and the safety. That's one of the most dangerous crossings in the city. It always has been. I've got old sets of plans from the 1970s where we, the city had designed a new overpass at that location just because it is such a dangerous intersection. So I think that that definitely needs to be part of this project, just like I think the new underpasses at South Grand and 19th and Ash and 19th need to be part of this project, but they aren't necessary to move the trains from 3rd Street over to 10th Street. Any other questions? I just Thank have you. one last question. It, when will enough work have been done on the Third Street Rail for the to do the quiet zone? You know? uh, the quiet zone on Third Street is really more a function of the work that IDOT is doing out there. The, the quiet zone on Third Street is not really part of the Springfield Rail Improvement Project. Okay. Our project is to get the trains off of Third Street, and that makes Third Street quiet. And that's something we're looking at by 2025. Okay. I know the city is look, working with IDOT to determine what it would take to get Third Street on an interim basis converted to a quiet zone. Cool. Anything else? So, all right. Thank you much. Sure. Thank you. All right, uh, next we have ordinances tabled to remain committee. Mr. Clerk, could you please read those ordinances? 2015, 121, 2017, 103, 2017, 266, 2017, 435, 2017, 436, 2017, 470, 2017, 475, 2017, 489, 2017, 532, 2017, 533, 2018, 005, 2018, 110, 2018, 141. I think there was a request from Alderman Thailand to go through those, and I think uh, Corporation Council Zirkel has uh, put that list together of ones we might want to withdraw. Do we want to do that now, or do we want to wait for 
Alderman Tylen to return, or what's the wish of the committee? Since it's Alderman Tylen's request, I'd say we wait till he returns. Ditto. All righty, we'll move on. All right, anybody asking to pull any of those ordinances for consideration? None? All right. Move on to ordinances for committee. Mr. Clerk, CWP. CWLP, 2018 143. An ordinance accepting bids and authorizing the execution of contract UW 18 02 88. Residential Water Service Materials with Core and Maintenance Main LP Illinois Meter Incorporated and Midwest Meter Incorporated in a total amount not to exceed $416,413.60 for the Water Division for the Office of Public Utilities. Any discussion? Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Clerk. 2018-144, an ordinance accepting bids and authorizing contract UE18-02-87, purchase of Unit 4 steam coils with Aerofin Division of Air and Liquid Systems Corporation in an amount not to exceed $58,714 for the Office of Public Utilities. Move for consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. 2018-145, an ordinance accepting bids and authorizing the execution of contract UE 18-02-90, trouble truck for TND with Landmark Ford Incorporated in an amount of $80,065 for the Office of Public Utilities. Move for consent. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries for consent. Mr. Clerk. 2018-146, an ordinance accepting bids and authorizing contract UE18-02-93, substation department bucket truck with Landmark Ford Incorporated in an amount not to exceed $98,665 for the Office of Public Utilities. For consent. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. 2018-147, an ordinance authorizing architectural services from Real Design Incorporated, architects and engineers, and an amount not to exceed $62,000 for phases two and three of an architectural evaluation for two facilities for a total amount not to exceed $118,800 for the Office of Public Utilities. Move for consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. 2018-148, an ordinance authorizing an agreement with General Electric International Incorporated for repair of Unit 33 North LP crossover assembly in an amount not to exceed $82,489.60 for the Office of Public Utilities. Consent. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. 2018-149, an ordinance authorizing additional funding in an amount not to exceed $85,000 for elevator maintenance and repair for Dahlman Plant Stack Elevators with USA Hoist Company Incorporated for a total amount not to exceed $157,000 for the Office of Public Utilities. Move for consent. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Right. Opposed? Motion carries. 2018-150, an ordinance authorizing an agreement with GP Strategies Corporation in amount not to exceed $183,500 for phases three and four of an implementation of an operator training and qualification program at the Dahlman Power Plant Station for a total amount not to exceed $208,000 for the Office of Public Utilities. Is there a motion? Move consent. Sure, second. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. Uh, Alderman Hanauer. So is this for people that are already hired, Doug, or is this with the anticipation of getting new people, or what's the? This 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 program really is designed for the whole uh, training program that we have for apprenticeships. It's not just even it's from you know as people move up through the through the union positions. It's revamping all those steps and all their training procedures. So do we do all this training uh, through external contracts or we do any in-house? A lot of it we do in-house. This seems like extremely a lot of money for a, a training program is all I'm asking, Doug. So that's why I'm having questions about the proposal. Uh, What's it equate to per person? Well, essentially, I, you know, the reason that we're doing this is is because of, you know over the years we we have lost a lot of knowledge, um, a lot of experienced operators, and we've seen a need 
to revamp the training programs and the the procedures that we have in place, uh, making sure that we're you know doing things more efficiently. <clears throat> it is it is a substantial amount of money, but it's definitely worth the investment to make sure that our staff, our employees, are properly trained for those jobs. They are very technical in nature. Uh, it's very important that uh, you know as really the, the jobs that they used to do. You know, you know, 30 years ago have changed quite a bit over the years, too. Now that we're not just, you know, running a power plant, we're running a, you know, a, a basically a chemical facility um, to for all the environmental controls. And it's very critical that we operate those pieces of equipment uh, most efficiently to make sure that we're in compliance at all times. Okay. Any other questions? See none. Uh, all in oh, favor? Oh, oh, yep. Alder Turner. So, <clears throat> what's the? So, how many? How many of these employees would be fairly new employees as opposed to twenty-year employees? Well, I don't. I don't, I don't have a, a breakdown in front of me right now as far as what age of the employees, but it covers everybody as far as all the union positions, uh, all the operating staff from apprenticeships as they first are hired in and they run through the, their, their steps, but also going from, uh, you know, a bottom job, I guess you'd say, uh, moving up to eventually to a unit control room operator. And I guess my question speaks to um, hiring practices, in, in internship programs like the Inspector General was talking about earlier and, and the, how we hire employees. Because if we're talking about newer employees, I don't know that we would need to invest this type of money if we had gone through a more stringent hiring process. I, I guess that's that's what I'm that's what I'm kind of struggling the, with. The training that we're talking about here is specific to our facility, so it doesn't matter what experience they've had; they still have to run through the training programs that we have to so they understand our equipment and the steps that are needed to operate and there's our no, systems. And, and there's no there's no opportunity to do that. At any point in house, or I mean, so who who's operating this equipment now? Our operators are operating the equipment, but what we're trying to do is improve the training for them and making sure that they're always being properly qualified as, as steps. And this hasn't been done for quite a while, as far as and I, I don't I I can find out when the last time that they have actually did a major uh, you know step through of all our operating procedures. I'm just trying to understand. I mean, I, I understand that training is necessary, and I understand the value of training. I'm just trying to wrap my head around this amount of money for the type of training that you're talking about doing. And so this, you know, so trying to, you know, for outreach, you might say, um, this is definitely not outreach. This is only for employees that are hired by us um, that are in the operating positions Oh, no, I, I, I understand that part. I understand that part okay. of it. So, and and this went out for this went out for bid, right? And there were no local vendors that um, there were no local vendors that responded. The, the, yeah, this this basically is designed from uh, professional service for that. So there there is no one locally that knows the power plant systems and, and procedures. They're going to a, a very big company to arrange this. Okay. Was it bid? Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to Mike, right now. It was, it was a professional service, right? Yes, it's a professional service. And so it wasn't bid, basically? Correct. I withdraw my motion for consent. I'd like to go to debate on this, please. Second. Uh, vote on that motion. Oh, wait. Uh, Alderman Fulgenzi had a quick question. Uh, how many employees does this cover? I mean, are we talking about 20, 25, 100? Uh, we, we have basically about 180 employees out at the power plant. So this covers all of them? Well, except for the, like, the superintendents. So there's, you know, a handful of other uh, individuals, maybe another 20 or 30 people out of that. So 150 people. Did, did so we, if we wanted to sit in on this, like, a, as an alderman, just kind of watching over and see how, what kind of training we're going through, are we invited to come sit in one of these classes? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, we can walk through the material um, at any point in time with you if, if you want to see it. Mostly, mostly curiosity. Just sure. want to see how this training goes down and what uh, how the company presents it. And if you don't have a problem with that, I wouldn't mind setting in one of these classes. Absolutely. Okay. Got it. Okay. A quick question, then we'll go to Alderman Hannah. And then Donald, do you have a question? No. Sorry. Okay. Uh, did we budget this? when we did the budget this year? Yes. And then is this going to be something that we'll continually budget for, just a one-time thing? No, this is more of a, of a one-time uh, thing as far as the initial assessment. <clears throat> the There could be future outlays, um, you know, depending upon what's desired moving forward after this, the, these steps here. <clears throat> okay. Alderman Hanauer. I guess, I guess my biggest problem on this is you're looking at a $200,000 um, $200, contract and we didn't bid it out. And I realize it's spe specialized training, but you, but there's there could be other companies throughout the country that could do it. That that might it could potentially lower the amount that what we're paying on this. That's my biggest complaint about this. We're, we're talking two hundred thousand dollars, and. You know, just to go out and just give it to one company without bidding it out, I'm sorry, I, I can't go for that. I just can't go for that. I, I, I believe in a lot in good training in that, but I still think we owe it to send it out for bid. I really, I, I just, you know, we can send well, it out. Uh, excuse bid, me, check the problem. A problem. Alder Red Path. Uh, uh, one second. I'm sorry. The mayor would like to chime in really quick. Then we'll go to you. So. Oh, yeah, one of the reasons on. uh, we hired our yes. auditor is that. Uh, you know, they've done audits of, I think, over 400 power companies throughout the country. So they're coming in, I think, within a week or two, so we could ask them. They have a list of uh, qualified vendors to uh, that have specialized in this uh, type of training. That's a good idea. And, yeah. and, the, and, you know, the problem, I agree with the bid process, and I think Doug does too, but when we get into a professional service situation, there's just not a lot of companies that are going to have the expertise to come in and train certain things, Ralph. And you... You understand what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not. I'm not criticizing your comments. I'm just saying that I I had hesitation on this ordinance because the amount of money for training that's a lot of money, and uh, as you all uh, chimed in on. But the bottom line is is that when we get to a point where it's a professional service that only specific people know how to make that kind of training, uh, you look around. Do we have a lot? Uh, do we have local vendors that could do this? I don't know. If we do, we're all going to vote for it because we want local participation. But when you get to the point where it's a professional service that only certain people can train, then we're going to be in that that situation. But I'm not looking at and, and real quick. I I don't. I'm not looking at it from. I, I understand the local vendor. You know, may not be able to do it, but. There may be other vendors around that, that can it. do the same training, and, and it it may save us money in the long run. That's that's all I'm saying. I got it. I got so, that. Uh, uh, sure. Yeah, come on up. Yeah. Um, sorry. We're talking about doing the... We need the mic, please. Yeah. When we're talking about doing bids and finding vendors, if we don't have them in the system and we don't know about them, we can't send it out to solicit those bids. So it just sits out on our website as open and no one may bid on it. So we won't get anything anyway. And then on this one here, this is phase three and four. So we already started the process. So now to turn around and go out for bid for it, it kind of would mess it up just a little bit. So I don't think we're asking you to stop the bid process. The question was, we should be automatically in a process that we automatically look to put out for bid. Right. And, and uh, when you go into professional services, we get that point. But how do you advertise that? I mean, if, you, if they're not in your system, that means nobody knows what's going on? Is there, there's yeah. got to be a process where it's globally acknowledged that it's out on the Internet someplace or somewhere out in the, in the, in the cyberspace that somebody say, uh, we can do that and we can do it cheaper. Right. And that's what we're trying to move towards. And we have our vendor self-serve now, so vendors can go in and register. Um, sign up for commodities and services so we can bid more. Um, but we're trying to get the word out there to get more vendors to register. So on something like this, a professional service, we have to go out and try and find people that can do this to send them the bid information. Okay. So, I mean, it's it's something we could definitely work towards and find out Look, how others the do The whole it. idea, the, the whole idea of what the aldermen are talking about, I'm not trying to speak for everyone, but the yeah, whole yeah. idea... <laughs> <laughs> 
the whole idea is that we are always trying to find a way to turn this back into local local people. We're always trying to find the people that are close to us that that benefits the city of Springfield more than going to Europe or Chicago or someplace to get to get a vendor. That's what we're trying to do. I think we have Director McCarty like to chime in really quick. Yeah, just wanted to mention Alderman Redpath that we do post everything, all of our bids, all of our RFPs out there on the website. Uh, we have a purchasing page where we list everything. The challenge that I think that the purchasing agent is trying to get at is, especially when you talk about something specialized like this type of training, is getting the word out to get their attention. We right, certainly agree with you 100%. We want as many people eyeballing these RFPs and bids as we can. We want as many proposals as we can get. The challenge for us sometimes is finding individuals and companies who can do that. And we've started that vendor self-service. It's going very, very well. We've got a whole lot of folks that are continually putting their information in so that when we do have these come up, we can blast out an email to those folks and say, hey, look, this RFP, this bid's out there. Please send us a proposal. So we and, continue and to do that. And I understand the technology. I understand the technology has changed over the years that you can't bring the old dogs back to teach these guys how to do these new tricks. But the bottom line is, is that... Um, so I get I get that professional part of right. it. Right. I guess what I'm trying to say is we're in complete agreement with the, the city council in this. All right. Okay, Alderman Donnell, and then uh, okay, Alderman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Director. Um, I understand. I appreciate the comments about the expertise that's involved in this type of uh, project. But how many vendors were contacted by the utility? I'd have to get back to you on that. I don't I don't have that information with me, but I will. Thank you. And, I mean, just to go back to that, I mean, so this is the phase three and four, you know, as it states. So I'd have to go and find out what they did for phase one when they initially started this process, where were they at with it, and who they, who they contacted. Okay. Uh, Alderman uh, Turner. <clears throat> so... There, there's a couple of things, um, and again, I understand the value of training. That's that's fine, but there, and um, and I appreciate the uh, purchasing, purchasing. That's hard to say. Purchasing, purchasing <laughs> agent coming up and, and offering an explanation. Thank you very much. But I think that there, the reason why a lot of these get scrutinized so much is because with CWLP, there's a history of so many contracts coming in that are not bid. So it's almost like nothing ever gets bid. And, and so I think that's why there's a lot of scrutiny. The other thing is, um, you know, the, the other thing as I look at this, so this is phase three and four. So phase one and two was $24,000. And then all of a sudden we go to phase three and four and we're up to two hundred thousand dollars. So what what is the difference between so so what's the difference between the the training schism or that takes that went from twenty four thousand that just automatically jumped to two hundred thousand? <clears throat> Well, but because we're not talking about we're not talking about any more employees, we're talking we're not talking about any different machinery. Everything everything that happened in phase one and two is exactly the same as phase three and four. But there's a well, phase one they basically look came in and did a gap analysis, so they did an on-site review, um, basically looking to see where our shortfalls are, um, and then. The phase two is to kind of lay out a, a guideline and, and a layout of the next steps and what's needed. So that's then that's what's developed basically the layout for phase three and four. So the the, the work that they they came in and did for that small amount is a small amount of work. This next step is the large amount of work. So um, that's going to take a lot more time for them to be on site, understanding the jobs, what's being done, looking at the older. Uh, procedures and older training materials that we have and then revamping those and then also then you know training our trainers so the people that we have on staff that are in a position to train um, those people will be trained to make sure they're, they're you know using this new material making sure that our operators are being tested correctly um, 
so there is a lot of effort that goes into this to make it ensure that it's uh, you know a big improvement over what we have okay and then and then this is the first time I heard you mention the train to trainer aspect so then when as new employees come in those individuals will be able to provide the same level of training to those employees correct yes all right any other questions on this I think there was a motion. That, that makes a lot more sense. So, yes. so no. you know, it just took us a minute to get there. <laughs> all right. I think there's a motion for debate. Second. So all in favor? Aye. Those opposed? So it's on debate. Public Safety, 2018-151, an ordinance authorizing purchase of a ballistic body armor and carriage systems in an amount of $95,238.61 for the emergency response team for the Springfield Police Department's Crime Scene Services Unit. Motion for consent. Second. Any discussion? Yep. Uh, Alderman DeCinzo. Uh, so this is, you have to spend this money, this is federal funds being used to purchase this body armor, is that correct? Police chief, come on down. That's correct, it is uh, asset forfeiture money out of our federal fund. Uh, but there is a typo on this. It should just be for the emergency response team. It should not be that part about the crimes and service unit. They're for our emergency response team. And how often will you use this type of body armor? They use it weekly, uh, two or three times a week. That's all I, all I needed. Any other discussion? No? All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Right. Opposed? See none. Motion carries. 2018-152, an ordinance authorizing a payment to Verizon Wireless for monthly data services from MDC and video units in an amount not to exceed $144,612 under state master contract CMS number 793372P for the Office of Homeland Security, Bureau of Emergency Communications. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. As opposed, motion carries. 2018-153, an ordinance authorizing a payment to Motorola Solutions Incorporated for monthly Starcom radio services used by the Springfield Police Department and Homeland Security in an amount not to exceed $108,120 under state master contract CMS number 3618850 for the Office of Homeland Security, Bureau of Emergency Communications. Move for consent. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. Th is this? All right, path. Is this, what are we doing with this, Chief? Is that, are we replacing the Starcom radios, or are we just? Come on down again, Chief. <coughs> no, we're not replacing the radios. Uh, that'll be in next year's budget, hopefully. <laughs> this is actually just our annual. You shouldn't have said that. This is our annual fee that we have to pay for Starcom services. Well, so this is the, this is the uh, uh, maintenance Correct. It's for us, it's for the fire, and uh, I, think the, I think we're the only two on Starcom on some fire. CLP maybe as well. Glad we're still in the Starcom situation because that's a great technology. Absolutely. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor for consent? All right. All right. As opposed, motion carries. 2018-154, an ordinance authorizing acceptance and execution of grant DD-18. 0481 from the Illinois Department of Transportation in an amount of $6,975.60 for the distracted driving mini grant and authorizing a supplemental appropriation in an amount of $6,975.60 for the Springfield Police Department. Move for consent. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Public Works, 2018-155, an ordinance authorizing execution of an amendment agreement with the State of Illinois Department of Transportation for construction of underpasses on Ash and Laurel Streets from 6th Street to 11th Streets and Associated Rail Work, MFT, section number 14-00477-00-BR for the Office of Public Works. Move to consent. Uh, second. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 
2018-156, an ordinance authorizing execution of a master services agreement with Geographic Information Services Incorporated for various support services and deliveries for the Geographic Information Systems and Computerized Maintenance Management Systems for the Office of Public Works and Public Utilities for an amount not to exceed $300,000 for a two-year period. Move for consent. Is there a second? second? Any discussion? Uh, yes. Is yes. this going to be on the red path? Is this going to be uh, stuff that's going to be put in the vehicles for the GPS locator sy systems? Director Correct. Mahoney, come on down. It's for the utility plus public works, correct? It is. It's a variety of things. And all the stuff we do of our mapping, our engineering, all that stuff is driven off of this. Probably it'd be better for ISD to answer, but that's my layman. I mean, but this is not the GPS locators for our vehicles, right? Uh, I think it's part of that, though. It supports oh, it? all that stuff. I can get, Let me double check with, uh, I'll get you more details on Thank it. You. That's basically that's, everything. That's all I need. So. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 2018-157, an ordinance authorizing payment of $250,000 for the second and final year of contract number PW17-24 under RFP17-24 <coughs> with Habitat for Humanity of Sangamon County for collection, recycling, and disposal of bulky items in an amount not to exceed $250,000 for the Office of Public Works. Good for consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 2018-158, an ordinance authorizing a contract with Bradley M. Ziegler and Sheila Ziegler for the purchase of one parcel of real estate located at 300 East Isles Avenue in an amount of $196,500 and relocation expenses and closing costs not to exceed $48,620 and for a total amount not to exceed $245,120 relating to the Springfield Rail Improvements Project for the Office of Public Works. Consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. 2018-159, a supplemental res resolution notifying the State of Illinois Department of Transportation that motor fuel tax funds in an amount of $245,120 may be used for the land acquisition for the Springfield Rail Improvements Projects, MFT section number 18-00478-00-BR for the Office of Public Works. Motion for consent. Second. Any discussion? Yes. Uh, Alderman Senior. Is this, uh, Director Mahoney, is this some of the money that will be used for the acquisition of those properties along this uh, usable segment four, I think it is? That's correct. That's exactly what it is. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. 2018-160, an ordinance accepting the lowest responsible bid and authorizing the execution of contract number PW18-02-92 with Truman L. Flat and Sons Incorporated for a FY 2019 alley overlay program in an amount not to exceed $374,719 for the Office of Public Works. Is there a motion? Moved in the Okay. Uh, Alderman Hanauer seconds. Uh, any discussion? Yes. Uh, uh, Alderman Redpath. Director, uh, so convince me why we're doing this. I mean, the, why are we blacktopping the alleys when we got potholes in our streets? Well, we do, it's part of the maintenance program. I mean, we, we have potholes in the street every spring, and we forever will. But what, if we keep spending at the level we're doing, we've been addressing them pretty well over the last several years and brought our ratings of our roads up pretty high. I don't know, people probably saw the trip over here when they had the state discussion about the quality of the state roads and the problem for the infrastructure. The rating system they were proposing was actually our rating, where we have our streets now, our local streets, are higher than what they were talking about. So on the maintenance side, that's not saying we don't need modernization. There's streets out there that need to be upgraded, so you can make the case to start moving on some of that. There's a large cost. But on the maintenance side, our streets are in, in, where they should be, but on the alleys, the same thing. So we, we don't, we rate the alleys just like we do everything else. These are usually what we do. We try to focus on areas that are high volume, the alleys that are used. Some people access their garages in some of these alleys. So we don't spend a whole lot of money on on the alleys. We try to pare it down and, and do where we need to. So $374,000 is a lot of money. We, and I, we got streets, I got streets. I got streets I can to identify them, so. to you today yeah. that that need overlay, and I and I got streets out there that we picked up under the lake service from, from lake services that need repaired. And you know that part. Okay. But the thing is, is that I'm not the only one. All the aldermen have streets that they need repaired, and instead of spending three hundred seventy-four thousand dollars on on alleys, we should be spending them on streets. And that's just my opinion. That is, uh, you know, we can hold off on it and. and 
no, you know what? I'm not trying to stop projects in, in other people's wards. I'm just telling you that this is an issue because half the wards out uh, half the wards don't have alleys, and you know that. That's correct. But but we have yeah, the rest of the city does. But uh, how many people are, you, are they driving down the alleys? Is that a thoroughfare for them? Yes. In some areas, they do. They access their garages off the alleys. My garage is on an alley. Well, not, not how, about, a, how about the streets that the people live on but that they don't have alleys that they can access to that they, they need overlaid? I got a bunch of them. I'll bring you the list. It, 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 yeah, and as you know, we go through and we rate those streets and we try we take care of the, the streets that need to be taken care of every year. And there's a whole process for doing that based on engineering standards. I mean, if you have something you think that are below that, we, we can take a look at them. The again. list will so, be in your office okay. tomorrow. All right. So, okay. uh, uh, Alderman Mancino and then Turner. Yeah, we, um, Director, I, I appreciate this. I know it's, it's a lot of money, Alderman uh, Redpath, but there's still some parts of the city that, that do require alley service. Some people still have their, their garbage in the alleys, and uh, some people still have their garages in the alleys. And unfortunately, uh, this is just a big part of Springfield because uh, I'm sure ICON appreciates that uh, we are doing this alley overlay so that we can have access to that, and we appreciate the work. Yeah, but, you know, it comes down to a little bit of equi equality, too. You know, we, we who are, are on the outskirts of the city, we don't get certain ser ser services like this, and this is a, that's a big chunk of money, and uh, the, we can fix a lot of streets with that. And I, I'm not trying to take away from uh, that, right. what you have to have, but we all have to be, uh, uh, you know, we all got to spread that money around. Uh, Alderman Turner. Um, so how did how did we come up with this list? Is it is it the same process as we do with the streets? It, it, exactly. It's every we do it less. We do it I think every third year on the alleys. Mm -hmm. And then there's another the larger portion we do in house. So our crews over the summertime, most of our alleys are not asphalt alleys. Most of them are. We even got some rock still, but they're mostly oil and chip or what we call the county mix. We've used on a lot of them. That's what our crews do most of the year. And there's about I think there's about 50 miles of that. There's about 80 miles of alleys roughly. About 50 of them fit into the other category, and that's what our guys focus on. Okay. Yeah, and, and I did see that um, in some of the alleys that are not, oh my goodness, <laughs> some of the alleys that are not um, asphalt, you did have crews that came through and um, cut back the brush and cleaned them out very nicely for those people that have to drive through them. So, um, so I appreciate that too. The the up that upkeep helps a lot for those that don't have the um, asphalt. Uh, Mr. Mayor. If you could, uh, how much are we spending on overlay this year? With uh, I have to pull the street contract. I think it's uh, three million, four million, somewhere in that range. Probably. We spent over the last five years something like fifty plus million or something like that. So, I can get you a break out of all that though, versus what we're spending on alleys. So, uh, Alderman Desenzo. So we have eighty miles of alleys. Roughly, and yes. I'm counting, unless I'm incorrect, there are seven wards that have alleys. Two through eight have alleys in some parts. Is that incorrect? Okay. So the majority, to your point, Alderman Redpath, the majority of our wards have alleys. Okay. Um, so why don't we find $374,000 and spend it in our three wards because you're getting the $374,000 that we don't get. Divided by seven. Well, whatever. We'll take whatever we can get. I got the roads that need fixed. We just we just acquired all the lake roads that were underneath lake services now are under public works. They're not getting fixed. Drive down these alleys. I mean, they're they're not drivable. I don't drive down alleys. Well, I do. <laughs> okay, Every hold day. on one second. I would greatly appreciate being think, recognized by the chair. One second before we continue. Um, you know what? We can have a debate. Yeah, yeah, before, yeah, Mr. Chairman. I understand yeah. that, but uh, then the mayor wanted to chime in, and Alderman Turner. Um, so. I guess. Uh, yeah, real quick, uh, that's the importance of the strategic war plan meetings. You know, we have limited resources, and uh, that's an important point that everybody's bringing up is, you know, you're here to represent your area. With regards to the lake roads, that's something that uh, Nate Bottom has taken a look at and prioritizing uh, how to address those because, uh, especially the coved areas, uh, not the main roads around the lake need to address. So there will be a strategic plan with regards to that. But the bottom line is you only have so many resources, so even we're not shorting one ward over another. I think there's, isn't it safe to say, there's overlay plans for everybody. Everybody gets sidewalks. 
uh, with regards to that. It, it's based off engineering standards. And Alderman, I'll say that we have been more aggressive. You'll see that this year, because we went out with our guys, we did the ratings, and basically instead of saying there's this amount of money, which has been done in the past, what we've done is we rate them, and the roads that need to be taken care of out of the lake, we're going to be addressing this year. You know, now, Mark, they're not asphalt upgrades with sidewalk and all that, but they're, you know. You know what, Mark, I've been on the city council almost 30 years with a little bit of break in service. You're the best public works director we've ever had. And I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, you bust your butt. You make sure all Thanks. of us get, we get the Texas at 2 o'clock in the morning that you're moving the snow. Uh, we get, we, we, we do see progress, and I'm not criticizing you. I'm just saying. You know, if we no, I hear, and we got a lot of good guys that, that uh, just like the mayor said, they <laughs> approach it professionally. They look at the city as a whole. They go out there and they try to take care of what the limited You're very resources aggressive. we have. I appreciate that. And the other thing I should point out is we don't necessarily do an alley overlay every year. I'll double check. So I know we went a long period of not doing any, and then we've done it like every other. I do think we did a small one last year, and we're doing that this year. But we'll go three or four years sometimes without an alley program. All right, Alderman Turner. Yeah. No, they can see. Okay, then see nowhere. No. Yeah, Chuck, don't try and butter him up because we're not changing anything. We're care. going to do the. <laughs> 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 okay. All right, are we done with this one? I, okay, uh, I think it was for consent. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 As opposed? See none? Okay, motion carries. Next one, please. 2018, 161, an ordinance approving the location sketch map of Mill Creek <laughs> Estates, phase two subdivision for the Office of Public Works. Move to consent. <clears throat> Is there a second? Second. All right. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 2018-162, an ordinance regarding the variance request of section 153.158B2 pertaining to lot arrangement at Mill Creek <coughs> Estates Phase 2 subdivision for the Office of Public Works. Moved consent. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 2018-163, an ordinance regarding the variance request of section 153.157J pertaining to Stubb Streets and Mill Creek Estates, phase two subdivision for the Office of Public Works. Moved consent. There a second? Second. Any discussion? It's, Alderman Senor. Are we, are we going to have another, uh, is Lynn Hart Road, Alderman? I don't think we'll have a problem with this. It's, uh, <laughs> Off the, uh, off, it's it's basically off aisles. Okay. I don't think we'll see another Lenhart Thank you. Pro. Thank you. You need asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have alleys out there. We have needed asphalt with you. So. Only three words don't have alleys. <laughs> I just want a sidewalk. <laughs> Will we amend this to get a sidewalk for you? No. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, those opposed, uh, seen none, motion carries. Next 2018 164, an ordinance authorizing execution of an agreement with Linda Hall Lewis for annexation of property located in 1915 Chelsea Drive. Second. All right, any discussion? Public hearing. Seen none. We have have a public hearing. All the motion not until the council. Okay. next week. Okay, so no, a motion for debate. Got a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The opposed? Seen none. Okay, motion carries for debate. 2018-165, an ordinance annexing certain described real property located in 1915, Chelsea Drive, <coughs> to the city of Springfield. Motion for debate. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Was opposed? Motion carries for debate. 2018-166, an ordinance accepting bids and authorizing the execution of contract number PW18-02-91 for the amount not to exceed $957,556.75 with P.H. Broughton & Sons, Incorporated, Truman L. Flat & Sons Company, Incorporated, Beelman Logistics, LLC, Vulcan Construction Materials, LLC, and Osborne Associates for the 2019 maintenance materials. Move for consent. Is there a second? second? All right. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. Vote present. Okay, with the Alderman Senior voting present. Noted. For consent. 2018-167, an ordinance accepting RFP PW18-23 with Petersburg Plumbing and Excavation, LLC, and Perry Broughton Trucking and Excavating Incorporated for cave-in repairs for an amount not to exceed $1,260,000 for the Office of Public Works. Consent. Sorry. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Present. 
Uh, Alderman Cena voting present. Motion uh, consent. Noted. 2018-177, an ordinance authorizing the execution of contract PW18-20 with TRB Incorporated for branch pickup and disposal services from May through June 2018 for an amount not to exceed $160,000 for the Office of Public Works. With consent. Second. Second. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Seeing none. Motion carries. Finance, 2018-168, an ordinance authorizing execution of a tentative collection bargaining agreement with the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers, District Number 9, from October 1st, 2017 through September 30th, 2020. Move for debate. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor for debate? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries for debate. 2018-169, an ordinance authorizing extension of a contract with Triune Health Group, LTD, to provide workers' compensation comprehensive case management services for the City of Springfield for an additional amount not to exceed $160,020 from February 1st, 2018 through January 31st, 2019 for the Office of Budget and Management. Good consent. There a second? Second. All right. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries for consent. 2018-170, an ordinance authorizing ex extension of contract CS 17-05-28 through May 31st, 2019 with Republic Services Incorporated, DBA, Republic Services of Sangamon County, and authorizing an additional $131,364 for a total amount not to exceed $262,728 for the waste hauling services using single streams recycling for the Office of Budget and Management. Move for consent. Or second. Right. All right. Second by Alderman Fulgenzi. Any discussion? Yeah. Alderman Hanauer. What's the What's the story on this? As far what's a single stream recycling? Director Mahoney again. So you put everything in one can. That's yeah. what that is. Yeah, Director Mahoney will come up. Is that different than what we're what we normally allow? This is actually an OBM contract, but yeah, it's single stream. It's basically everything we collect from the buildings and the facilities that goes into, they bid on it every year. Republic's had it for the last few years. They put it back out, I guess, this year. And um, what it is is it goes in one container, and they haul away, and they sort it, and they shipped off, recycled. Right. Thank you. So. Figure out what's going on. All right, Director McCarty, do you have anything on this? No. no okay. No, All right. That's pretty much it. It's just for our waste and recycling for around here. Okay. Got it. All right. Any other further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries for consent. 2018-171, an ordinance authorizing the execution of a professional services agreement with and payment in an amount not to exceed $22,000 to Peckham, Guyton, Albers, and Vets Incorporated, PGAV, to provide a feasibility study regarding a tax increment finance district for an area generally bounded along the north side of Lumber Lane between Golf Road on the east, East Sangamon Avenue, Illinois Route 29, and Kent Butler Road, Illinois Route 36 on the north, and I-55 on the west and generally known as Lumber Lane. Move to consent. Second. Any discussion? So we got um, yeah, Alderman Fulgenzi, then Turner, then Donilon. Uh, East Sangamon Avenue, Illinois Route 29. Is that right? Yes. Uh, Route 29 is on uh, Rochester Road. You want Abby to come up here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but doesn't it cross? It goes down uh, Walnut. Hold on, she's coming. Yeah. Um, I believe you all have a map uh, designating the area. It was included in the last page of your contract, and if you don't, I'd be happy to provide you with that. Um, but we're looking generally um, for an area that's kind of a wedge shape far east on Sangamon Avenue. It turns into Camp Butler Road out there. But that's not at Illinois, one, Illinois 29. Okay, we'll make the correction. I'm not sure, we'll just have to check. It may be that there. We can, yeah, we'll check it and make the correction if we need to. You do know where you are, John, don't you? <laughs> Thank you. Sometimes. <laughs> it was his roads. Uh, Alder, I think it was Alderman Turner and then so, Donilon. So is this proposed to be a targeted TIF district? 
So we are doing it targeted to that area. Um, functionally and in terms of our process, there's no difference in that in that way. We'd have to go through the same steps to establish the TIF as we would any other. What would be the intent? I mean, is there something going out there or is there, I mean? I'll defer to the mayor. Yes, uh, LS Development, uh, they're out of uh, Peoria. They're looking to locate into the Springfield area and to be more of a regional approach for construction supplies. So it's a lumber yard and uh, I think uh, they plan on employing up to about 30 individuals. So originally it was a targeted TIF just for them, but when we looked at the area, there's other needs out there, so that's why we decided to expand that boundary. Okay, um, do you have any additional questions on Turner? No. I'm okay, good. then uh, Donilon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Abby, uh, I see that PGAV is, is the proposed uh, consultant. Mm -hmm. Are any other consultants contacted for proposals? Mm -hmm. We did not contract any other, contact any other consultants. Uh, as you know, PGAV has been doing this work since the 80s for the cities. They're so familiar with what we have going on that, um, you know, they're our first choice. To the best of your knowledge, I know it was before your time, has the city ever contacted any other consultant in the world other than DJV for a proposal? Um, so I don't, I can't go back as far as the history of time, but um, uh, I sit on the Illinois Tax Increment Assessment Board of Directors, so I'm very familiar with the other consultants that are in the area and working with Illinois. Um, I work with them, meet with them at uh, conferences all the time. Sure. Um, you know, PGAV has been such a great partner for the city that that's who I would recommend if you were to ask me that we go, you know, that we go out for bid for one of these or, or try to approach another consultant. Um, I think that we just, we have such a great relationship with them and they are so familiar with what's going on in our city. They're, they're our best choice. Um, we have had other consultants who have approached us to propose TIF districts, um, but we have not worked with them since I've been with the city. I, I don't have no reason to question the quality of work we've gotten from PGAV, but to kind of build upon Alderman Hanauer's comments earlier is, um, since the 80s, we've never reached out to any other mm -hmm. consultant to get to get a proposal. And, mm -hmm. and I don't want to slow down this uh, this project, so I think it's a good project. But however, I would just encourage in the future, before we come, and there will be a second, if this study is, is successful, meaning that there is a need for a TIF or mm -hmm. steps are taken, maybe that's the opportunity to uh, reach out to other firms and see what kind of proposals we get. Sure. Right. Sure. All right, then uh, Alderman Senor, then Redpath, and the mayor. Well, how, how far does our corporate boundary extend out there? Uh, and um, what what else out there would be able to, that they could take advantage of the TIF? Do you know? I'm, yeah, so um, actually I'm glad you asked. We just uh, produced a map today that shows the extent of our corporate boundaries in that area. As you know, there's a lot of unincorporated uh, parcels there. We we are going to, while we do the field work to do this feasibility study, we're going to be looking at um, some of the adjacent parcels and see what else might benefit from being included. We're going to take it north across Sangamon there um, and go up, I think, as far as the Nudo property which is um, up on Colt Road to the north. So would that include the Coca-Cola bottling plant out there, or are you not going to include that? You know, I just don't have a good mental map of exactly yes. what's out there, but we are going to be driving this week. Um, PGAV is coming into town, and we're going to go and, and do, do the feasibility study and get some parcel data. Okay, yeah, could you come out, come, when you come back, could you have what, what businesses might be impacted and could take advantage of the TIF? Because sure. I'm, I'm familiar with the area, but I want to know what all is out there. Mm -hmm. a, yes, um, so we're going to gather that data this week. I don't know if I'll have it totally ready for you to look at, but we can have some preliminary lists of what parcels are in that, and we're, we're going to look and see um, what would qualify under the, the TIF Act to be included. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I think uh, Alan Redpath, did you have a question? I, I was just going to follow up with the mayor's comments that uh, LS is going to be a potential 15 to 30 million dollar uh, rent sales each year. It's a big business to do they sell retail to the local lumber yards and their reach is going to go within a hundred mile basis, a hundred mile radius of the city of Springfield. It's going to be huge. Big deal. Thank you. No problem. Uh, okay. Oh, done. okay. Any other questions? Questions? One of, the, one of the things they're going to be purchasing is the Boss Gloves Warehouse. It's over a million-dollar property. 
about eighty thousand square foot warehouse, so it's a it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, seeing no more discussion, uh, I think it was for consent. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Next ordinance, Mr. Clerk. 2018-172, an ordinance authorizing extension of an agreement with Midwest Risk Assessments Incorporated to perform lead-based paint risk assessments and clearance inspections services from July 16, 2016 through July 17, 2020 for an amount not to exceed $50,000 for the Office of Planning and Economic Development. Move for consent. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. All in the Are there any targeted areas that we're approving this for? I mean, $50,000. It's just for all of our home deferred loan programs, wherever the house is located, they go in there and they'll do an assessment on the lead based paint risks. Okay, so this is for homeowners. Right. That we're going to do rehabs on. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor for consent? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. 2018-173, an ordinance authorizing execution of a sponsorship payment in an amount of $15,000 to the Illinois Route 66 Events Incorporated for the International Route 66 Mother Road Festival to be held in downtown Springfield September 21st through the 23rd, 2018 for the Springfield Convention and Visitors Bureau. Consent? Second. Any discussion? Seen, oh, all the woman Desenzo. So this is from an international grant. It's not from Hotel Motel. Correct. Uh, can the mayor answer that or anybody here from? That's what it says. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it or, says. All right. I'd have to defer to OBM on that one. We'll get it for you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor for consent? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries. 2018-174, an ordinance authorizing a five-year memorandum of understanding with the State of Illinois Department of Natural Resources for a space located at number one Old State Capitol Plaza, known as the Lincoln Herndon Law Office, to be used for the Tourist Visitor Center for an amount not to exceed $20,000 annually. Is there a motion? Move to consent. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Those opposed? No. Okay, no. So got, all right, let's, uh, we got all in red path and all in the of voting no, so what's that leave us? Uh, that leaves you. Uh, <clears throat> would you like a roll call? Sure. Okay. Alderman Red Path? No. Alderman Sinor? Yes. Alderman Turner? Yes. Alderman Fulgenzi? Yes. Alderman Proctor? Yes. Alderman DeCenso? No. Alderman McMiniman? Where are you, Joe? We lost Gone. Him. Alderman Donlin? No. Alderman Hanauer? Who is gone? That leaves you four yeses and three noes. So what is that? Does that not carry? Is it the motion? Is the majority of those we'll present? We'll be back in a minute. Oh, okay. wait. <laughs> Paging Corporation the Council, hour. how do you rule? <laughs> if, if you want to wait for a moment for the alderman to return, you can, but it would just be a majority of those present, so 4-3 would send it on as consent. But, of course, it's subject to debate, you know, at the full city council. All right, well, we will hold. If someone... I may never come back. <laughs> He went to the bathroom so he wouldn't have to vote on this. <laughs> what about, oh, Joe's? <laughs> uh -oh. Why don't we send it on? Um, Tim's going to get him. Tim went to go get him. <laughs> he has to so say no, it. So no search team. Ask him if he can call. I don't think his vote's going to matter. I mean, is, then it would just be a tie. It'd be. No, it'd just be for debate. Right. Or send it on. Yeah. Is he calling back? Uh, oh, he hung up. He hung up, yeah. Oh, I think he's done with me, right? Sent the police to get him? That's right. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Sent the police chief to get him? <laughs> and that's the sergeant of arms? <laughs> hey. Your... hey, Ralph. Hey, Ralph. It's not hard. You go to debate or you go to consent. It's one of the two. Hey, Ralph, I mean... did you wash your hands? <laughs> 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 
checked. So what, what's what my what's the deal here? Just say yes. Yeah. Just deal. say yes. Number two thousand. Oh, no. oh, no, no butter now. Nah. <laughs> Number two thousand eighteen. Alderman McMinniman. Yes, uh, I lost contact on the phone. I'm a yes vote on the twenty eighteen. Yes vote. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. <laughs> Alderman what? Hanel, it's two, 2018 174. Do you vote? Yes or no? Yeah, it looks like, it looks like you phoned, phoned a friend. Yeah. <laughs> what are we going for, for debate or for uh, consent. Consent. consent? For consent? Yeah. I'd rather go to debate, so I guess it would be no. Okay, so where does that put us? That five puts four. us five yeses and four noes. Did we give consent for Alderman to, uh, uh, McMinimum to vote? Yes. yes we did. We did. Before yeah. you got here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't know if we had to do to the roll yet, John. Yeah. <laughs> did we add to the roll? We're tonight, man. <laughs> we did. That's okay, right. good. So, so it's, it's on. Five I was only five minutes away. You guys really moved. <laughs> Where are we at? So it passes. All right, it passes for consent. So what was the final vote? Five, five four. four. Five four consent. All right, uh, moving on. <laughs> General City Business, 2018-175, an ordinance approving the appointment of Alan Riney as fire chief of the Springfield Fire Department. Second. Any discussion? Would you like to come up, or how do you, Mr. Mayor? How do you like to? Yeah, I'd like to do? talk to him. Is he here? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, while he's walking up, I just want to explain why I made the motion for debate. Anytime we have a, anytime we have an appointment, we put it on a debate. Uh, I intend on voting for you. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alderman. Sir. Uh, ready? Um, sure. Can you tell me what you're going to do different than the other chiefs before you to bring uh, the fire department? We we got some serious issues uh, facing the fire department, so tell me why we should vote for you. Well, a lot of what I want to do is, in the short term, is shore up the uh, internal, the internal workings of the fire department to make us more efficient, to make us um, communicate better. We're class one. We uh, are doing a great job with our ILS plan. Uh, we're making lives better for people. Externally, we're doing great. Internally. Uh, there's some problems just with the way we communicate, with the way we, um, the way we do our business. And that's in the short term what I want to do. After that, once we establish our staff and get everybody in place, then uh, the plan would be to come up with long-term solutions, mid-term solutions. We have stations that are going to be on dead-end streets soon. Uh, we have um, just our need for growth. Uh, it'll be really interesting to see uh, the traffic lights, I think, uh, getting into a uh, Alderman Hanauer's uh, district uh, going south on veterans. I worked at that station. It was, uh, it's unbelievably slow. And I think this uh, traffic light, I'm looking forward to uh, getting that through, uh, analyzing the data to make sure it makes a difference before I come back to the council and ask to take those routes otherwise. So uh, some of the problems we have with the fire department is being very top heavy. Uh, we have extremely the large number of captains. Um, do you have any plans to restructure uh, the, the, the manpower that you have uh, as far as the command staff is concerned? Well, the command staff is, is smaller now than it's ever been, the but, command staff. But we from still have 64 chiefs, captains. From the battalion chiefs up. The, uh, uh, we have nine battalion chiefs and 64 captains. There's really, with the way we're structured, with the way the contract is, uh, there's a captain is in charge of each apparatus. So that's 45 right there. Mm -hmm. And then other divisions, uh, Division Two, is, I consider those our experts. They're the ones that we train, highly train people to go in to know uh, how buildings are um, in compliance with building codes and um, you know, no, there's not really any, any. Um, I don't see a, a vision where we're going to be more efficient if we have less people doing those jobs. Well, the, the, I've done analysis on other fire departments of the same size throughout the city, uh, central Illinois and in cities our size. Uh, they don't usually use captains in those positions for fire safety and that type of stuff. And we have, uh, I believe, six captains in that division of currently that is correct and and so I'm wondering if if we can't scale that that process back and bring 
keep just bring in professionals. I get it. I get you got to have a higher expertise, but do they have to be captains? I um, mean, you know, one of my problems with uh, when when people get to the top of the command structure is that we don't figure in when people come in on for pension uh, purposes when they come in at the bottom as a firefighter. We don't f always figure that they're all going to make it to the top, and that's one of the reasons that that's not it's not just the fire department. We have some similar problems in different departments, but we, we've always figure out that that uh, when you put somebody when somebody gets a, a, a higher rank than than they're expected to get or we or we surpass the uh, capacity of, of command staff that we need or they get a spike walking out the door or they get a pension or, or they get uh, raises that uh, that were unexpected that that goes right into our pension problem and um, I'm not saying we we're going to go in and lay off fire captains or anything like that. That's not what I want to do. But through attrition, we have to down. We have to scale that back, and we do have expertise at the fireman's level, at the driver's level, at the lower levels that could come in there and do similar jobs. And I, I have a lot of respect for the fire safety unit and and the, and what you guys do. Look, I want you guys coming to my house when it's on fire, okay, and dragging my big butt out of there. But <laughs> the bottom line is, is that we have to worry about how we're going to uh, address the pension system we have. And it's not just you. The, the chief of the police department knows he's got a similar problem. It's not necessarily in the command staff, but we, we are to the point where we got to address our pension problem. And uh, we got to start someplace. And I'm, I'm looking for somebody to think outside the box. Tell us what you're going to do to help us get to that to that goal. And, and uh, obviously, as Springfield grows, we're going to have to have more firemen, more policemen, more, more of everybody. But I, I just, I'm looking for somebody to tell me Look, if we try this, we're going to get to the point where we're starting to scale back on that that pension problem because that's a mess. That's sure. a mess. And, and, and I'm sorry. Go I ahead. I'm so, uh, no, and and tier two honestly is going to fix a lot of that. It's going to fix a lot of it. Unfortunately, there's a lot of attrition that we have to go through to get to the tier two pensions. Um, it's on the things that you mentioned, the getting promoted later in your career, on, uh, of course, we did away with the longevity, longevity accelerator. I actually was part of negotiating that out with the union um, to get rid of those things because, yeah, we don't want to falsely inflate somebody's pension. That's the point. And, and I don't I'm, disagree I'm with that pleased to hear that you're, with your background, that you do have an expertise in, in the fact that you know understand the contract situations that we have and the, and the pension problem we have. because. Nobody, here, nobody sitting around here, nobody in this room uh, has any, uh, any big plans on how we're going to fix that pension problem. And we got to, look, Alderman McMenamin and I don't agree on a lot of stuff, <laughs> but one thing I do agree on is that we need to start addressing that, that big elephant in the room, and which is that pension problem. So please Understood. think about it. I, I'm going to vote for you because your, 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 your credentials are, in, you know, very good, and I'm, I'm going to vote for you. But... I need, we need people to start thinking outside the box so we can move forward and try to get that mess under control. I, okay. I don't disagree. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman McMiniman, did you have a question? No question. Thank you. All right. No further questions. He didn't agree with me, did he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. All right. Thank you. Congratulations. We're one step closer. Um, all right. Motion for debate was seconded. Any no further questions. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries for debate. 2018 176, an ordinance approving the appointment of Susie Woods to the Springfield Disabilities Commission. Second. Any discussion? Is, uh, I have a question. Sure. Alderman Turner. So it says that she will replace Ashley Jelks Frazier, whose term expires in February 2021. So is the other person is um, resigning or? And is Miss Woods here? She will be here next Tuesday night. Uh, Ashley moved out of town and close oh, okay. to. She had not been attending meetings, okay, so she had. Yeah, it, it was just kind of confusing sure. for me. Any other questions? Discussion? Seeing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion carries for debate, and that concludes our ordinances, I believe. Um, any unfinished business? Yes. Uh, Alderman Redpath. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we are changing the um, utility committee meeting from the 19th of June till June 11th. Uh, uh, Superintendent uh, 
Doug Brown can't be here, so we're going to change that to the 11th. I won't be here. Well, you're not as important as he is. But. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Right. Feel the love. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Room, you are very nine. important. <laughs> so we're changing it till June 11th. June 11th. So can we and can we make sure that we get that information out as early as possible and as repetitious as possible to every media outlet known to mankind <laughs> and every social media outlet known to mankind. And put it on a flying saucer. Also, or and can you also make that announcement at every committee and city council meeting leading up to June 11th? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Don't forget, you'll be out a press reminder. <laughs> Alvin Senor. Uh, Director Mahoney, please. Thank you. Sound like a time. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Uh, with the sp spring coming, hopefully it'll be here tomorrow, 70 degrees forecast. Um, could you check out the uh, railroad tracks on 19th Street, uh, preferably between uh, South Grand and Spruce? I've gotten some complaints that there's been some illegal dumping and the grass is tall. And also on 19th and South Grand, they said that the ag grade crossing hasn't been finished. They said it was grooved and grinded. <laughs> Never came back and, and did the finished product of, of the asphalt or yep. I'll, I'll up to the grass. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right, Director Mahoney, really quick while you're there, and we're talking about railroads and lawn. It, it, are we good for the Third Street Rail Corridor for grass with UP? So we have actually, we started a few weeks ago, though the weather didn't come with us, but we started, we called the Clean and Green Meeting. So we meet every week with our housing division, our solid waste crew supervisor, and go over items like that. So we've started a railroad report. So starting actually this week, or well, next week probably, we're going to have a housing inspector run the railroad corridor, and that, particularly that UP corridor we've had the problems with. So what we're going to do, the approach is uh, we're going to cite them, and then we have a contractor lined up to mow that corridor and to build them for the that cost. It's a new approach because we haven't been successful in getting their cooperation, so that's the route we're going to start this year. So we're just going to take it on and we're going to do it. So we're going to be more aggressive and we're, we're going to uh, we're going to do it, basically, but we're going to send them the bill. So. Okay. I greatly appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Uh, Alderwoman DeCenzo. Uh, Doug Brown. Is he still here? Director Brown. Anybody that wants to come up? For his part? Sure. It's referred to the IRP. No. Go ahead and ask it. We'll try to answer. Okay. We were supposed to receive a port. Go. Oh. Yeah. Do you want to come up? Well, I Give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Quit raising your hand. Or don't stand up. No. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, it's okay. We were supposed to receive a report on the uh, where we were with this at the end of March, and we're now into April, and we haven't received anything. We were supposed to receive a report on where we're at with the IRP? Just where where things were going or oh. how we were proceeding. Um, I think we're planning to do a detailed presentation at the utility committee meeting, okay. and also you'll be seeing an ordinance hopefully soon. We'll have to approve the ordinance before we can get started. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other? Uh, do you have one? Red? Oh, okay, okay. Mr. Mayor first, and then. On the IRP, I know uh, Alderman Hanauer had concerns with regards to uh, T being one of the recipients. They were the low bidder, so um, we're checking to see with the auditors if they would review those and uh, see if uh, you know they meet the parameters uh, adequately or if they have had ex experience themselves, the auditors, with the three bidders. and. Uh, get their opinion on it. And so uh, we'll go from there, but that'll be offered as additional information. The other thing with regards to unfinished business, the wet bar had, um, as everybody knows, the uh, Liquor Commission uh, wanted to, or ruled to reinstate their license within that six month period. We met with the owner on Friday and went over the uh, additional parameters with regards to um, items to, um, meet or follow. One would be tracking capacity when individuals come in. They're going to have ID verification. Uh, cameras will be installed at working cameras. He had cameras before that uh, sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't. Uh, and those would be uh, upon request. If the police would uh, request a video of that, they'd be able to see it uh, 
immediately, and then also security officers. So th those were some of the parameters. But the other items are, you know, there's other uh, establishments that we're taking a look at, and uh, that sets the guidelines for others to follow uh, when they reach that level of uh, level of uh, needed enforcement. Yeah, Chief, can you come up for a second? Um, just a really quick question then. And and then we'll go to the next one. But while he's coming up, uh, different question. Uh, you know, the YMCA uh, that uh, looking for link to relocate in the East Park, has there been a breakdown yet of how that money's going to come together? Uh, I know Corporation Council's working with uh, the group uh, for Memorial Health Services with regards to an agreement, and they're working through that process. So uh, do you know the timeline? I think it might be forthcoming in the within the month. Um, yes, I believe it will be pretty pretty shortly. Okay. Uh, then, Chief, I know wet bar was open. What's <coughs> Friday and Saturday night? Uh, is there any issues? No issues. Good. Okay. Cool. Uh, all the uh, my list I had Red Path first. Do you have a question? Well, uh, I have some questions for maybe the mayor or. or uh, HR, basically. Well, can I ask my question while he's up here? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Alderman Turner. Oh, please. <laughs> he got here before you did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, why? So I noticed. You won't let that you go. You don't want to play this game with me, John. You really don't. <laughs> so I noticed that um, the, the two cameras are set up downtown. One is like by Wet Bar, the other one's farther north. So how long are those going to stay there? They're already removed. Oh, they're gone already? Yep, they're oh, they were just for the weekend? Yeah, we had them out there for the weekend. Obviously, uh, we wanted to anticipate any kind of issues. Uh, uh -huh. We wanted cameras in some dead areas where we didn't have uh, locations we could see, so we were trying to put them out there. The long-term plan is to get some additional cameras on that block to cover basically Jefferson all the way down to Monroe Street. Good. Be and that, that's, I wasn't, that's no. why I was asking, because... There's a lot of issues downtown on Fridays and Saturday nights, and not just at Web Bar, but all up and down that mm -hmm. corridor. So actually, I thought it was a good idea that you that you had them out there. Yeah, we're trying to get a panoramic view of uh, not only that area, but as we can afford to spread out, we will. <coughs> Great. All right, uh, Alderman Redpath. So, Mayor, maybe it's um, this is for you, or or maybe HR, but uh, we've. We're about two mo months into the budget, and we talked about um, cutting back on spending and cutting back on hiring, but I see that, uh, and we've actually had some people that had hours reduced and that type of stuff, and I was just concerned because um, we're posting jobs still, and uh, there was like 15 or 16 jobs posted just recently, and um, we already know that we're going to be in a deficit situation next year. Why are we hiring? And I mean, if it's justifiable, I, just tell me. I'm, I'm trying to figure that out because I'm, I'm, I understand that we're, we are posting jobs and we are hiring people. So uh, we're not in a good financial situation, and I just want to know what, what we're doing. Yeah, I'd let HR uh, come up and explain the postings that are forthcoming. Uh, but with regards to any layoffs, that's really uh, based on the departments. I mean, that's what they're funded for. I know, uh, plus the revenue sources for the funding. You know, like uh, Convention Visitors Bureau, they have, they're funded through Hotel Motel. has nothing to do with the corporate fund. Uh, so that's what you have to look at. OPED, some of those are with regards to grant funds or TIP funds. So those are different areas. Uh, but with regards to specifically um, within the mayor's office, there's been cutbacks. And uh, when you have a office of three and everybody's asked to cut, there's only, you know, there's going to be cut back on hours, unfortunately, and that's the situation we're in. Uh, so you're right, uh, we're slowing down uh, hiring as we can, but there's other areas that uh, when people leave, uh, we need to have those come in. And I think from the budget, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think we were supposed to come back with a report when individuals aren't, are hired within the six-month period that we were hoping to slow it down and put the reasoning for that. Okay, that helps. I think that's... Is that how everybody remembers that discussion? Okay. Thank you. So, I don't know. I mean, the Director process Cousin. for the, of going through hasn't changed in, in multiple administrations. Uh, when a position is vacated, they do a fiscal review form, which goes through budget. Mayor ends up signing off. As far as the timing of the posting, um, it may be posted in most cases at this point after the incumbent leaves. Uh, there's going to be exceptions. The benefits manager is leaving us, so I can't let that go for six months. Uh, the labor relations manager will be hopefully doing interviews on that uh, next week, within the next few weeks. Um, 
a lot of the positions are not fun, corporate funded, as the mayor indicated. So uh, there are, and, and as we post, by the time, our average fill time at this point is four to six months for most positions, regardless, corporate or not. So um, the <laughs> ultimate decision as far as the, the timing of the fill will be determined by the mayor. There may be a six month gap, it may be less than six months, depending on if the department justifies that they need the position filled sooner rather than later. If there's justification for, for hiring that we just can't get around, I understand that. But mm -hmm. you, you guys all understand that we're going to scrutinize this for the next 12 months. We have to. And it's not a mm -hmm. shot at the mayor, it's not a shot at you. It's just that we have to be as frugal as we possibly can because we're, we're, we're looking at another deficit. And, and we tend to, like when you see so many postings go up at once, we generally don't post one or two jobs at a time. So we hold on until we have a group of them. That's why it may seem like, my gosh, they're posting so many positions. It's intentionally done like that. That just helps us get through our process. Okay. Thank you for the explanation. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. Um, I think Alderman Hanauer had a question. My, I've got one for new business, but um, on on the same aspect, I, I know we had uh, uh, with uh, Tony Thompson. He's you, you you cut him back, and and uh, my understanding, I thought that I guess I I don't know whether it was uh, I I felt like during the the budget that. People that were going part time were people that had requested to go part time, not that we were forcing them. And and I guess the only problem I have with with Tony is we we have a contract for video work or something like that through Benedictine. And I'm sorry if it comes down to keeping Benedictine, who's basically left the city of Springfield, I say cut the contract and let Tony do that work. That's just my personal opinion because to me. You know, why should we why should we have a contract on something when somebody that's very well qualified could do that work? Um, that's, I mean, ultimately we don't have a say so, uh, but I just feel like we should not have a contract for with Benedictine for the the video uh, work that we we approved if we are if we're cutting cutting back on video techs. I guess the answer to that is uh, I'm not sure the funding source. Uh, I think the PEG money is for the um, Benedictine contract that will bring back the uh, ability for nonprofits to do cable access programming. Uh, with regards to personnel, that's really the corporate fund driven. And uh, so if an alderman wants to fund his position, bring forward an ordinance and we'll fund it. I mean, that's the, that's the issue we ran into. I mean, so we're doing our due diligence. It's almost a damned if you do, damned if you don't. And we uh, took it upon ourselves. When we submitted the budget, I asked all the departments to cut back. And I know Alderman Redpath brought up about the fire department. I underfunded the fire department. It wasn't easy, but I underfunded them by four positions that he was alluding to. Three captains and a battalion chief. And I caught a lot of heat for that. And that's what we're getting right now. So any alderman wants to bring forward an uh, appropriation ordinance for what we've done on the cutbacks. But I was pretty clear all the way along that uh, there would be some part-time individuals impacted. We didn't say be voluntary. Uh, but through attrition, that's uh, how the uh, ones, uh, I think that was came up on the fire department. How are you going to bring on that class of nine or however many there are? That's through the retirements. It allows us to bring the, them on. Uh, so really, it's a tough situation, and I do have a response typed up. Uh, uh, Director Cousin sent me a response by the union, and uh, I don't want to get in for tit for tat, but I'll stand by our decision. I mean, it was a tough decision, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the situation we're in. And so we have cut down on personnel. It's not easy, but that's where the cuts come from. And so that's, nobody's happy about it, but if an alderman wants to bring forward the appropriation, that's what it will take. It's my understanding you have to appropriate the dollars, whatever that amount is. We can calculate it out and bring it forward. Uh, alderman Senor. Um, just for clarification, uh, would you uh, reiterate or tell the, the people involved that the city council does not do any hiring or firing or recommend? Mm -hmm. All we can do is recommend monetary appropriations, but we have no authority to hire or fire anyone. And because I've got some questions, I'm sure as everyone else, and I appreciate you bringing up that fact, Alderman Hanauer, about the, the video tech and Tony Thompson, because uh, uh, I think Tony's done a lot of good work for the city. And, and um, uh, we do have an employee, I think, that works for the city, that works for home, 
involved with this video stuff. Uh, and uh, I think we need to look into that closely because um, uh, it's important that, uh, and I'm not, it's not a shot at you, Director Cousin, but is it just things that are involved with the budget? I think the question was asked uh, during the budget was, was there any going to be any, any positions cut? And I think there was only said there was going to be one position cut. And I never heard anything about people going to part time. I don't, I mean, I don't recall any of that. So maybe it, it was said and, and, and I missed that night. But um, just for informational purposes, the city council has no authority to hire or fire anyone. Is that correct, Mayor? That's hundred percent correct. correct. The appointing authority is the only one that can do the hiring. Mm -hmm. um, that would be for every office with the exception of clerk and treasurer. And those, those individuals are the appointing authority for their respective offices. Very good. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Any other? Any other unfinished business? Moving on, new finish or new business, Solomon Hanauer. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Did nope, you? No, you first. Um, when uh, we got here today, we had email on our computers here, um, and I'm, I clicked on it. Came up. It didn't ask for a password or anything, which okay. concerns me because <coughs> it's under my name. I assume it's under all the aldermans and their own individual names, but. I guess the concern, number one, I, I've got enough email accounts. I don't know that I necessarily need, need another one. Um, the other part of it is these computers are used through, through the week. And I, to me, this is a um, security issue because somebody could get in and send something as me or Alderman Donilon or any of us really and I would just prefer, I mean, is there a reason why we have to have a, a city account? I, I, I know we have to pay money per account. At least that's the way it used to be when I was in the business. So uh, I, I'm just trying to find out what's going on. I guess we'd have to have ISD uh, answer that, but I don't know why the computers, they shouldn't have it. It should be, I think it was brought up uh, because of last uh, weekend's um, issue with regards to Alderman not receiving information over the weekend, things of that nature, having a city account would allow that to happen. And so that would give you access to uh, city emails. Um, and I can throw one thing out there also. Um, yeah. To access like a lot of the resources we have, the um, single sign-on that we use throughout the city, all of our employees have an email account. So I don't want to speak for John West out of turn, but I do know that everyone that has a sign-on to a computer also has an email account. So that's just the way that they're setting it up. Well, uh, I just, I'm concerned about it being on these computers and, and other people logging in during mm -hmm. the week. You know, they everybody knows what the passwords are on these, which automatically opens up our, the email and, um, you know. Yeah, we'll have that change. I don't know why they were on the assigned to the computer. I don't know why that would be. Yeah. So it's it, and, and you know it's. I don't know. I I seem to have no problem getting emails when people need to get in touch with me. So I just don't really need another email account to to monitor and and all that. So yeah, if you'd uh, I guess let all. Uh, Tim Griffin, no, and then he can relay that to uh, John West. If you don't want that email account or what email account you want listed, then we can have that provided. Okay, uh, but we'll have them taken off the uh, no. systems if they're on there. Okay. Well, we, okay, then uh, Alderwoman DeCenzo. Um, two things, weather permitting. I'm saying this strongly on Saturday. Uh, it, it, we were having a Ward 6 cleanup date. Uh, we're meeting at the Mellow Cream on Laurel. Um, I would love to do a citywide cleanup date so we all just pitch in and clean up those dirty, filthy alleys. Because Get that's cleaned what, up then. That's what we're trying to do. Get going. That's what we're working on. My alleys are really clean. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the first thing. Uh, rain, heavy rain is predicted. So um, I will be using social media and make a decision by noon on Friday, but just want to let everyone know that. Mm -hmm. And um, as a legacy family of the Springfield Sports Hall of Fame, um, I'm waiting to be inducted for my um, city champion mile race in 1985. But uh, Ralph... Alderman Ralph Hanauer was inducted last night as part of the SHG 2005 football team. He didn't play. Oh, oh no claps. <laughs> but, 
<laughs> but he was one of the coaches, so I just wanted to acknowledge that accomplishment. Thank you. Okay. You're the uh, reason they won, event. Ralph. We had Alderman Donnellan and then Turner. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I know we, we touched upon the OBM contract report earlier, but I did have one question to ask the director. Sure. Um, could you talk to me or explain to me what this CVB $24,000 for contractual service to assist in assessing departmental goals, plans, budget, provide updates is all about? Yeah, that's a uh, contract with Jeff Berg. He's uh, helping out with international visitors and other items with regards to uh, Convention Visitors Bureau. So that's where the funding's coming from. Is that something we've done in the past, or is this new? Uh, no, it hasn't been done in the past, but they are shorthanded. He's the one that actually did that and then had stepped down from his position. And so uh, that was something falling through the cracks that really needed to be picked up. Uh, because we get a lot of visitors, international visitors. He uh, really provides that support uh, system with regards to not only them, but other visitorship. And actually, with the uh, visitor, uh, with the uh, Lincoln Herndon Law Office uh, Visitor Center, he's going to help uh, uh, coordinate that activity with regards to uh, you know, bringing it to that uh, full circle with regards to the uh, development of that uh, with you. You particular facility names. for us. Well, thank you, Mayor. I just, mm -hmm. I just hadn't seen him before. I, I, know, mm -hmm. I know who Jeff is. Uh, he's mm -hmm. always done a great job, and, and I was just curious because uh, it's, it's, it's something I wanted to make sure it was something new. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Alderman Turner. Okay. Um, I was looking for some clarification. I've been bombarded with phone calls from um, Seneca Systems, and they said that they had talked with other aldermen, and I think they said that they had done a demo with you. No. Mm -hmm. Well, she said that she was, and I asked her who she had been working with, and said she had been working with the city of Springfield about developing some kind of platform, um, messaging platform. It was she said she, call too. Yeah, yeah, said she had been working with, and I said, who at the city are you working with? She said, John West. She said, I've talked to, I've talked to other aldermen, and I've done some demos. Can I set up a demo? I said, well, who else have you done a demo with? And she said, she was, because I helped her with your name. She said, Sonora. And I said, you mean Senor? <laughs> and, and she even said that you said that you wanted, that you liked the demo and you wanted your daughter to look at the demo I, too. I haven't done anything on behalf of the city council. So if, she, if I did talk to someone, it was on my own personal behalf and she might have misconstrued it. Because I never mentioned the city of Springfield. Okay. In my conversation with her. I know who you're talking about now, but I've never okay. mentioned the city of Springfield in my conversation. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out. Send out an email. I think that's the four one. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out who it is, who it is, what's going on, and and she was, so I'm just trying to figure out what's going on. We've had a couple of these. That yeah, but can so, I, I know you know because she's called you too, but can someone with some authority tell me what's going on? What person look into it or? Well, I'm just asking. I, uh, I'm Hannah. <laughs> I, I, well, I certainly don't have the authority, but I will tell you that I, I, what it is is it's a constituent uh, uh, tracking uh, No, No, software. she explained that. I want to know if, in fact, the city of Springfield is working with her to develop this and it's something that we're actively entertaining doing. I understand what it, it is. It would be actually very nice to, just from what I, I gathered, because... Okay, can I ask, can but someone... We'll check into it. Thank you. I'm just trying, <laughs> I'm just we'll trying find to out. find out if, so we'll if in it. fact, I'm trying to find my email. the city of Springfield is working to Seneca, Seneca, systems. Seneca, Seneca systems. systems. And she told me that she was had been working with John West, and he thought it was a great system and that we should, and that if all the aldermen wanted to do it, we were going to jet ahead. Sounds like fake news. <laughs> <laughs> what we want to make sure is it integrates with what we're doing. So the uh, last thing we want is another software system out there because yeah, what we're trying to do is type. Uh, Treasurer Busher talks about this all the time, the ARIA system that's been in place. City Works, we've been yeah. working on that for since I was treasurer. I mean, so yeah. that's what we don't want is uh, having a new software system coming on that really is more interference yeah, with right. what we currently have coming up. Yeah, so. I, that's why I'm But just we'll check on to, and if it makes sense, we'll we'll uh, look into it. Oh, Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Well, Chairman, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, I, I, I remember now, I talked to the lady, but I did not do it 
<laughs> as a representative of the city of Springfield, so she must have misconstrued when she spoke with Alderman Turner, and I want to make that perfectly clear that my conversation with this lady was not on the account of the city of Springfield. Well, I'm sorry I helped her with your name. I am too now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, any further new business? I don't see any. Uh, we had one person request to speak. Uh, you're going to help me with his name. Jim Kiefer. Jim Kiefer. Jim Kiefer here? That's nope. two weeks in a row he signed up and didn't show up. All right. Anybody else requesting? All night. Nope. Motion to adjourn? Uh, we had a hand oh. up. Okay. Reggie? So, come on up, Reggie. Oh, you know, before he comes, mm -hmm. put your mic on. Yep. Before he comes, this is, since it's a spring, at um, 2 o'clock on Friday, uh, the Spartan Garden will be open, and we're inviting all the public to come out. They're going to have, they actually got a, a, received a grant for a check, so um, since it's spring and we want everybody to get into that fever, and it is a public garden, so they do well, and the students participate well in this. And then one like, uh, quick thing before Reggie starts, I'd like to highlight uh, Director Juan Herrera. Uh, Winter warming shelter remained open. I think I think tonight's the last night, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I just want to commend uh, Director Herta and his office for, and all partners involved, helping hands, everybody, everything, the mayor, and for keeping that place going. Uh, it's been it saves lives. Uh, so just want to thank you, Juan, for for doing that. Well, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, because of the weather was really cold. We had a lot of snow. Uh, we decided to open the. Uh, we're supposed to close. Uh, uh, the March 31st, so I, I, I spoke to the mayor and also I reached out to Alderman Proctor since this is word, and uh, we decided to open the, uh, the, the uh, Winter Warming Center for another week. So, you know, people were, you know, safe and, you know, due to the weather, so. It does and save I know, lives, so thank and you. I know, and thank you for coming Saturday and providing the meal, too. I appreciate that. My, our pleasure. Thank Thanks. you. All right, Reggie. Let me stay here up here, Juan. <laughs> what I'm saying is, um, I understand Juan did a great job this year, but we also, I'm looking at the weather map, we still have like eight more days of under 30 weather. And I want to know, and I'm questioning, can the warming center stay open or just a little longer? That's all. Because this week and next week, it's it supposed to be like 38 to 28. And I would like to, you know, basically, for the homeless people, when the weather gets to 40, they can close it. If it's under 40, let it stay open. It's just a request. That's all I have to say. Okay. I think the weather is supposed to be in the 60s tomorrow, I think, and the, and the next couple of days. 70s? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, I, can, uh, I can reach out to Helping Hands and go over the weather report and... Uh, and uh, Give an update next week, but uh, as far as I know, uh, tonight was the last night for the shelter. So we we're supposed to close the 31st, and you know today's the 11th, I believe. So we went the next 11 days. Yeah, you guys did a lot of work to stay open. I know it was a hard press. So I appreciate yeah. doing that with helping hands. And, and I commend uh, Eric Smith and helping hands and the board of directors. I met with them, and uh, they've been a big help. Yeah, exactly. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, uh, motion to adjourn. Move. Move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Jeez. Jeez. <laughs>